Hello, and welcome to Scuttlebutt, the war movie review podcast. We're happy to have you with us as we take a look at films from the dawn of cinema to today. We aim to provide a raw and unapologetic review of each film's cinematography, historical accuracy, and delivery. In the process of analysis, certain details will be revealed. These spoilers are only divulged to ensure a fair assessment of each film. We drive east to the Volga this week with Joseph Vilsmeyer's 1993 Second World War epic, Stalingrad. As always, I'm joined by Mike A. Hello. Mike B. Yes, sir. And Nate. It's here. It's finally here. Yeah, it is here. So, guys, what'd you think? Well, I think, unfortunately for Michael, I think he should lead. He'll also give <laughs> us a chance to test the microphone. So, <laughs> Well, um, so yeah, as I've talked to you guys before about this movie, um, this is a pretty popular movie amongst war films, you know, especially people who are into, uh, you know, German war films. And I'd never really had the chance to see this from beginning to end. For some reason, I would always, when I would try to watch it, I'd always have to stop it for some reason and um, to do something else, you know, just busy. And uh, that was years and years ago. So it was nice to finally get to watch it again, watch it from beginning to end this time. And I thought it was pretty damn good. You know, I thought it was pretty solid. Um, I don't really, I can't think of anything at the moment where I could really criticize it. I thought for what it was trying to do, which was, I think it was one of the first films to try and pay some kind of homage or some kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, try to show the German army in a, in a good way in some, in some way, even though it shows them in many bad ways in this film too, trying to show, trying to, you know, not just show them as villainous, I guess, you know, I think this was a movie that was trying to really drive that, you know, don't blame the soldiers necessarily. Um, and, uh, I think it does a really good job of that. I think it has a lot of really interesting things in it and, uh, it's very, uh, you know, it, I, I also really liked how it ne it doesn't vilify the Russians either, because that happens sometimes with, you know, German war films that they, I try and, you know, say, well, this was the enemy. So we have to, you know, but like I did think that the Russians were also depicted very, very well, uh, Ger both Germans and Russians. So coming out uh, swinging with this, I would say it's pretty freaking solid. It's good. And uh, I will pass it to the man dressed for the hour, Mr. B, even though unfortunately no one can see it, but he is decked the out. The poke's got to go because it's like it's <laughs> fucking up my hearing and it's scratchy. And it's I was going to say, you, you are fucking decked out, dude. But I'll, I'll do it after the intro. <laughs> okay. So I'll be in yeah. there. But everything else is OK for now. But uh, no, I agree. And so I had seen this years ago and I, I was like, yeah, the same thing. I was like, it's really good. And all the points that you hit, I agree with. And but. I do have criticism about it because there's some parts that I didn't remember fully that I thought were, they fell very short. It was like, for, uh, so basically in my opinion, the first hour was very good. It fell short for about 25 minutes and then it got good again. Mm. As far as like, um, just macro and micro level details. Uh, but it overall very good. And, yeah, like you said, I didn't. I like that it didn't vilify either side. It was just this situation fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah, like to, for everyone, it's it just fucking sucks. Nobody wins. So and and it it, it, it kind of um it it um points to some of the psychological shit too, which I did like because in in ninety three nobody well not nobody I shouldn't say that it's a very blanket statement. Very few popular war films get the psychological aspect mixed in with a film without going so far that way where it's just a psycho like Apocalypse Now, mm -hmm. in my opinion, is like all psychological. And yes, the, the, the practical and all that shit is like whatever. But so this film, in my opinion, um, combined those two, like the situational shit and the psychological shit very well. Um, yeah, for intro, that's good. Uh, Nate. Uh, yeah, it's funny. Um, this is probably like the forty seventh time I think I've watched this. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I fucking love this movie. Um, uh, before we started all this about uh, about two years ago, I think it was like this was probably one of like the top movies that I would probably like recommend. That would probably be like ten out of ten, like perfect. It still is to give somewhat of a spoiler of what I think about it, but I mean, 
it's interesting to see how digesting all these other war films over the last two years has made me kind of realize some of the things I, I don't particularly like about it, but it's not like critical. It's not, um, <laughs> it, it's, it's not like hyena road <laughs> or anything like that in God, but it's like, it, it just, there's a lot of really key points that I think are really cool and really interesting about it. I mean, I'll echo the same thing. Mike and Mike said, like, they don't portray, you know, anyone as the bad guy in that sense, but like, like, like demonizing in that sense. Um, most sides, whenever you pick a side, there's always has to be like some kind of villainy and, you know, kind of, you know, demon side. It's a very much a film that I don't think there are a few other films that kind of hit the same level, but there is such a high quality of caliber for this film that just I can turn it on any time. And I end up trying to get something done, and I don't get anything done because I end up watching the damn thing. So it, it's just it's just a wonderful example of I think attention to detail. Um, that I know there's some little things here and there, but in terms of like the quality of film, it is really remarkable to go back and watch it again and see the caliber of props and and settings and pyro and just all this other stuff that we just can't see anymore in this day and age and i think that is what makes this this movie kind of really last in my eyes there's more to it but that's kind of like my opening thing for that um brian this has always been one of those movies that like at least in reenacting has been revered it's like oh my god dude that's fucking awesome you have to watch that and so yeah just like nate i've probably seen this movie at least 20 times and uh it still holds up it's very interesting film. You know, I probably hadn't seen it in like two or three years. But uh, no, I, I don't have a lot to say good about it. I don't have a lot of bad things about it. It's really awesome movie. Um, and it generally follows the story of, you know, the battle and everything. It, it does a really good job of getting the feel of it and everything, which is why it's awesome. Um, but no, it's it's definitely top five German war films. And... Uh, yeah, it's always hard to go last, so to jump right into it, <laughs> you know, um, the fucking soundtrack is awesome. And this is a lesson in films of how a soundtrack should be applied. Just enough to make you feel yep, agreed. like you're being encompassed by something larger than yourself. There, there, there's a theme, and the theme is in different tones and different, different rhythms, but it's still the theme. It's it's very interesting to kind of go when you look at you listen to the soundtrack and you look at everything and you go oh like there's the same rhythm there's the same theme it's just melancholy or more pumped up or whatever. But um, they also to interject a little bit with that they did when you were supposed to pay the utmost attention and feel uncomfortable there was nothing, mm-hmm. and I I loved that because yeah. most films war films or whatever just films in general like it'll be a soundtrack the whole way through that kind of guides you and how you should feel. But when you have nothing and it happened a lot in this film, it was like, you could, yeah, you know what I mean? Like you're kind of missing yeah. something and you're like, Oh, I should be looking at this. What's going on. Oh, yeah. so Brian, a lot of directors use music as a crutch to get through mm-hmm. scenes and to, you mm-hmm. know, agreed. It's intrusive, really yeah. bad acting and stuff. And that's the problem. When in reality, in this situation, you know, music is not a crutch. It's when you really need it to get you through something, you're on your own, just like you would have been in the real situation. It's like, oh, fuck. What do you hear when he's basically drowning in fucking shit in the sewers? Nothing. You hear water because he's in a sewer and he's drowning, you know? That is the soundtrack. Not yeah. like, Lily by Lane. No. You're fucking drowning in a sewer in Stalingrad. <laughs> like, you know? Well, just imagine how... how- unimpactful the firing squad scene would be if it had music, you know, right. during it, like during that whole scene, all you can hear is just kind of like the subtle wind and such. It's that, Good and that, that is theme music. <laughs> it's, it's terrible. <laughs> it would just ruin it. Damn, but, damn, damn. <laughs> but the fa- yeah, that's like when you know not to use music is when it's the most impactful. It's yeah, absolutely. Nate. There, there's, there's only a few times in this movie where, I feel like music is overpowering, but I don't think it's from the music choice or anything like that. I think it's the power of sound editing in 93. Mm, interesting. That's what I think. Because it's it kind of... This movie 
it's funny. This movie is it's made for ninety three, but it feels like a late eighties film in, in terms of like the quality of product of production and stuff like that. And I and I what I mean by that, I mean like uh, the the movie tends to suffer in my eyes with the music. Uh, since we're on that subject, is when it's overpowered. And there seems to be a lot of examples in the 1980s, particularly, where music is just deafening. And I don't know if that is the lack of control within the editing part, because, I mean, obviously, 93, it's going to be film you know, editing. So it's like, you know, I wonder if it, half of it is, like, is because of that. Um, but it's not, again, it's not like the music takes anything away. It's not Gallipoli, as we always use that as an example of horrible music choice and horrible music editing. It's, it's, it, in terms of, in terms of impacting a scene and whatever and it being too powerful and too loud. Well, I don't want to get off topic from the movie, that, movie, but when you say like um, that's kind of an 80s yeah. thing, other than Gallipoli, can you think of any other examples? Cause I'm trying to think of some now that you mentioned that. Um, not not nothing that comes to the top of my head but like normally like when i watch like stuff in the, from the late 80s or early 90s like for example like i've been watching like a lot of i've been rewatching quigley down under a lot <laughs> i love that movie i absolutely love my movie it's a guilty little pleasure tom but Selleck, they're, yeah. the little tom sell yeah nuns don't work on sundays yeah um <laughs> and so like 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 i love that movie but there's the uh, it suffers from a few scenes where the music's just like wah like in that like just, right. uh, uh, just aggressive and I don't mean like it's aggressive music it's just the music is so loud that I can't hear anything else oh, really I going know. on. One of the best so. uh, directors when it came to he said uh, John Carpenter who made like the thing and stuff like that he always said uh, the soundtrack should be wallpaper you know it should you yeah know, it should be there to to enhance something but not for you to notice it. Did not, right. yeah, and I thought that's a good, and, that's a good and way of putting it. I, and, I, and I think, and I think that just exactly how you said it, I think there's some scenes in this movie that just the music is so loud, just to be so nitpicky about as an editor or the way I want to digest films. It's like I'd rather hear the people yelling at each other over the music than the music being over the yelling. Because there's just some there's some essence like this, and there's a there's a scene where the guy's like trying to get out. He's like trying to make that guy get out of the hole, and he's flailing and going, "No, no, I don't want to get out of the hole. No, no." And he blows up and goes, "So long, idiot!" You know, and he runs like that. <laughs> that editing was a little um, clunky. <laughs> yeah, like like the music blending is just clunky. I'll also talk. It, well, I'll let Brian go, but I I do want to talk about dubbing in this movie. Yeah. In terms of like, I don't mean like. Like I also hate English movies, so I never watch. I was watching this original language, ori- sorry, original language, and this has wonderful real German language in it, and I always suggest people watch it that way. However, the the real publication of the movie, there are like two or three characters that are overdubbed, and they don't line up at all, and I want to know why so <laughs> well, bad. I did a little. I did. I did a little. Uh... Uh, background research on this and apparently a lot of this was filmed in Italy and well, the, the first scenes in Italy but like Finland and uh, Czechoslovakia and such and um, a lot of European films it's only been in the recent couple decades where they've stopped doing the dubbing like Italian films are famous for that that the, the way they shot movies was that they would shoot the film and then do the sound later even like the like they wouldn't record voices you know during the scene they would like dub it later in Italian, you know, just the actors doing the, I, it was just, a, it's kind of a European thing. I don't know if this kind of fell into that when it come to, came to, came to that, or the actors they had might have not been native German and they just, their accents sucked. So they said, well, we got to fix that later or something. I don't yeah, know. that that's, that's what I think has happened, mm-hmm. ha- happened with it. Um, You know, I, 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 if I remember correctly, Italy, I think, still has that law where they, they dub it. They have to have the dubbing. It's, like, it's they really have weird. have to redub it. Yeah, yeah I don't it's know some what it weird, is. like, like media intake law in, in Italy. Mm-hmm. Um, James May World, uh, or, or Man Abroad, the James May show, that, that taught me that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but like that, that might be that might be the reason why there's that horrible dubbing. Because like, they, it's that one character. It's the captain. That had that like oh, his voice does not ne- match up any of his lip up. movements. Yeah, never. no, never. And it's only that character. Yeah. So I just don't know. Yeah. What, like it's that guy. He's just constantly just off sync, um, and I, it's only him. I looked. Uh, I just was. Well, we're talking about because I have the cast pulled up. I just looked him up. That actor is Czech, 
So, uh, oh, he might have been yeah. speaking Czech then. Yeah, so maybe or that. Yeah, or he was his German was terrible or something. So they had to. Dub That's it what later. I mean. Yeah, his accent yeah. was just too much. Yeah, yeah. Again, like fucking God or what was it? Um, Goldfinger, the German or the villain in that is totally dubbed by a Scottish guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> and if you listen to the originals, yeah. thank God they dubbed him because fucking he sounds like shit. Great acting. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, they do it for a reason. Yeah, they did it for a you reason. know. It it's um. I guess I guess to launch the conversation uh, into something I find very impressive every time I fucking start it up is just real PPSH 41s, mm. real MP40s, mm-hmm. awesome sets. Oh, yeah. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, sets were phenomenal. Some of the best, uh, yeah, that I've yeah. seen. Before we get into the battle, because it's so easy to jump into it, I love the beginning. And even though... There were no, as far as I know, units from North Africa that were taken and sent to Stalingrad. I love it because it just really shows in a very quick way, you know, how the German military was in the spring and summer of 1942, how they're operating, how they were all over the world. You know, it's even something that Michael, like, nodded to in his film with the DAC veterans in Italy and, and stuff. And so yep. it was really cool that they do so much in such a short span of time. And that sets awesome in its own because that's something I realized, like, as I watched it this time, it's really a descent into, you know, the battle and the hell of Stalingrad. And it starts with the sun and the beautifulness of Italy and everything. And I just love the contrast, you know, because they allude to it the whole time. It's like, Oh, you know, you hate the, the desert. It's so sandy and everything. And, as Anakin would say, "Don't even I hate the send." <laughs> 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 so, he was a. You, remember, you gotta forget he was at El Alamein fighting the Eighth Army. But um, I have held you, Michael. I have held you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, I just really love the beginning and that set and everything is just so awesome. And how you think it's a model, it's done so well, and then all of a sudden they're riding the train later on and everything. Like it's it's just really cool. And even the train cars are right and everything. It's not like 40 and eight cars. It's like, no, these are European passenger cars. And it's just, I love that. Even before you get into Russia and before you get into the, the monotony of, you know, the Eastern world. So to come out of the Italy thing, that's what I was going to um, kind of, the perception I got from it watching it this time is, was that unit not on kind of like RRR and like recuperate or rest and relaxation, but recuperation too. Like, cause the, the port, I believe I might've fucked this up. But like, I think that port that the city that they were in is like in North, uh, Eastern Italy or something like it's that. Where, I'm pretty sure they were alluding to. Yeah. So it's up there. And like, I think I, I, I don't know what unit they were in. They said they're, they're, they're pioneers, the but like, I don't know. Sixth, um, pioneer battalion. Um, yeah, but you can't, you don't know what. Well, Part of the 36th Infantry Division. I actually did look it up. Okay, so is it possible they might have been on our, like, a recovery? As a platoon, kind of like, it, it very small numbers, possibly, but they alluded to in the film, like, their regiment was, got that, them to El I Alamein, mean. and they were taken. The, the thing is, the way the situation was so precarious at the time, which is something we'll get into later on, which is a big part of that mm-hmm. with Stalingrad is no units were taking out of North Africa like that. Whatever they sent from North Africa, they couldn't okay. take out of North Africa. So everything they so, sent... So, but like you said, a, only, platoon, a platoon would be fine. Like, if you got a bunch of guys wounded... you get some survivors, you might, yeah, you get, like, yeah. you know, that's fine. But the way that but they as far as the to, regiment, like, they, your regiment yeah, okay. has been taken out from Egypt, mm-hmm. and it's like, no, that's too much of an empire. That's too much of a, like, everything's perfect, we can mitch and match. No. They sent two and a half divisions yeah. to North Africa in 1941, and they just sent and replacements. For the whole time, yeah. the 17th Panzer Division or whatever it was stayed the whole same. The fifth, tenth, the tenth, fi- and the the fifth and the yeah. whatever it was. There, but there were two main ones, and then there were some yeah. light ones. But yeah, they only sent replacements the whole time until the Falschmiga showed up in November of '42, which plays into this story as well. Those are the only real replacements that showed up in North Africa. So they wouldn't have so, pulled so the regiment. So to out say they were in nor- uh, northern Italy or whatever for a recoupment and refitting, I guess, thing would be kind of, like, bullshit. It would be very, very, very tricky. Okay. Again, guys that went to North Africa really stayed, you know. Sure. To get yeah, a retread yeah, yeah. that early, it would be really hard. 43? So yeah. The, yeah. You, get, you get retreads. Kursk? Oh, fuck yeah. But this is just a little too early. Yeah, so that, that's... Uh, I, I knew about half of that, but, like, I just want for our listeners to understand that at the beginning of the film when they're all just having fun, as a unit, like, as a... 
I think it was their battalion. Yeah, because there was artillery guys and there was whatever. Because they're engineers. They're or the pioneers, Sturm pioneers. And it's like they have that big formation, which we can we'll get into in a second. But like you see all the different guys, but it's a huge unit, and they would not have been pulled off the line in Africa, even when they no. were getting fucked. There were units so. though that would have a very nice existence that before they went to Russia, like a lot of false schmiggers that jumped on the Crete, they ended up at Neva like three, four months later, which is some of the worst fighting outside of Leningrad. Um, like a lot of the Gebirgsjäger units that fought in the Balkans, they had a good time yeah. in Mediterranean Greece before they went to Russia. Um, and even technically in Crimea, all those guys were issued fucking DAC uniforms and tropical shit. Even Kuban, which is not that far away from Stalingrad, because it's basically a huge fucking swamp. Yep. Um, yep. You know, so you do get this funny warm Mediterranean feel, even though you're in the East or whatever. But I just love the beginning, regardless of, of that little. You, no, I'm not. I'm a disagreeing yeah, with you on just, that. Because you get the sun yep. and you get the frost. And it's yep. just like this. It really reminded me in a way of a watered down apocalypse now. Like you, you guys, yeah, it's a good contrast. Yeah, know? it's like it, it is because it's like you get the kind of the, it's the attitude as well of like, hey, life is good, man. We finally got some rest. We're good to go. We're just enjoying life. We're flirting with broads. We're fucking them once in a while. We're drinking wine, eating cheese, soaking up the rays, reading books. The weather's nice, and then all of a sudden it's like, but here's the thing: is one day that can all change. And if that was like a that, unit that yeah. hadn't been fighting in Africa, that was just stationed in Italy, and they're like, well, hey. I think that's kind of what they might have been going for, but it, because they, they constantly said, yeah, we were in Africa. Like, remember that time in Africa? Mm-hmm. Okay, so. But, like, yeah, it's like, oh, well, now you're going to Russia. Oh, Russia, we'll be there in three three weeks, and we'll be back home. And I, uh, I love okay. how they don't kill off the former lieutenant as well, how he's there lingering. He's, as But like, he's, like, messed up. Yeah, yeah, but he's like, I want to go with you guys. Like, I want to go with you guys, and they're all but like. But he can't, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. like, that's. And, and it gives this yeah. idea of, like, a temporality of a combat situation. Of like, oh, mm-hmm. we're getting in there, we're going to do the job. We got into Ebon Emil, we did it. We got into here, we did it. We got into there, we did it. Okay, now we're we're going to Russia, we're going to do it. And it's like, oh, we're yep. going to make the Russians swim in the Volga. Like, oh, fuck, you know? That uh, that, mo- that that opening scene with the there the guy in the wheelchair, the original, mm-hmm. like, not, like, it's not just that he's, he has, like, a busted leg or something. He's supposed to be, like, fucked up, right? Like, his head's, like, messed up, right? I think they said he like he got concussed or something. Okay, yeah, because yeah, he kept he's he kept acting like, like that. Kinda, and no, yeah. really quick though, the acting in this film absolutely fucking phenomenal because yeah, you can great sell actors. anything like that. Because yeah, he was like out of it, and all of his guys knew he was fucking just done, like completely fucking done, and he's never going to be the same. So yeah, yeah and that's really why important. it's like yeah, I, I want to go with you. Oh, just and they're like, no, nah, here, go over here. Yeah, like it's it's really interesting though because talking about the actors and I, I kind of think we should probably go in a little bit in order as close to sequential order in the film as we can tonight. That that's why I said for later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but like all the casting is very interesting because they're German actors that you don't, only other than I can't remember his name, but the guy who plays Fagelein and Downfall. Thomas Kretschmann. You, thank you. Yeah. He's in everything. Yeah. I mean, he's always the German soldier. Unfortunately, he's in Stalingrad 2013, the only good part of that movie. <laughs> he's in the that one as well. <laughs> he's the only one that's in both of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he's in, like, everything playing, like, a lieutenant. Yeah. Normally. And this was one of his very first roles within, I think, that realm because, like, he, fuck, he's even in Valkyrie. Yep. He's awesome in Valkyrie. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, like, it's just, I, I think... It's just like, but it's, but I say that because I, I don't, I've never really ever seen any of these, any, I've never seen any of these actors in any other thing. He's also the, and I wonder, he's also the, I wonder the, if it's, oh, sorry, Nate, go ahead. No, it's okay. I, I, I was just going to say, like, I wonder if it's just like a European regional thing where these were not, you know, obviously didn't get into Hollywood actors, but I wonder if they've been in a lot of European stuff because I just, I've never really seen any of them anywhere else. Probably. Look I would say DVDs. so. Yeah. They've been in a ton I, of shit. Yeah. Probably. Okay. Um, I was I started laughing because he's also the 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 villain in U five seven one. Thomas Kretschmann is. Oh, I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> oh, he is. Yeah, that's him. The, Fuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he is. Yep. I yep. I have that over there to watch. I haven't oh, watched God, it yet. Don't. So, yeah. It's so bad. <laughs> it is that is a terrible movie. <laughs> Matthew yeah, McConaughey. You, you got to drown if you're gonna save us, okay, kid? That's the last plot device. Oh. Yeah. The, the, the guy movie. from from Stalingrad is is the bad guy. I think in I that. might have seen that <laughs> well, theaters. I was like, eight. The, so it's like it's like uh, I wonder how many of these German actors, and and well, German such Austrian because Kevin, I'm going to throw you under the bus if you're listening to this. I wonder <laughs> how many times you're going to get cast nowadays as being a German soldier <laughs> from World War Two. 
Because let's <laughs> let's be real. I mean, anything's better than that Spanish war helmet he had uh, on. So. No, yeah. it was Bulgarian. It was Bulgarian. Bulgarian. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was. It, it was, was not good. But but um, yeah. it, it's like I wonder how many like German actors in general are just like cast by American companies to be like, hey, you speak? Oh, you're native German. Okay, cool. Can you can we play a German soldier? Right, yeah. No, you know it's, what I mean? I, I've often thought about that with every German actor I encounter. Like, okay, how many German soldiers have you played from World Can War II? Can you be II? Nazi number four? Right, yeah. Right, uh, yeah. Oh, he's also uh, <laughs> Thomas Kretschmann. He's also the guy in The Pianist uh, who saves him at the end. Yeah. yeah. Oh, like, yeah, I, he is. Yeah. That, was, yeah, that, yeah, was yeah, a, yeah. that was a ride. That movie was right. Anyway, Hell let's get yeah. back on track. The, but this was, I think, kind of his first... This was probably the first one where he was like, you know... And he German fucking killed officer. it. Yeah, he's he great. He fucking killed it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. So we're... The, yeah. Well, I was going to say, just to lead off the props, I'd be mm-hmm. going, I guess, going into Stalingrad. I mean, like the, like Brian said, the trains are unbelievably cool. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're so cool. And and it goes back to my intro comment. Choo-choo, well, we've never seen, we've, ne- <laughs> we've never seen a movie with this production scale with this amount of real war props and sets. Well, they did research so well. That's the thing. Yeah, and- so well. It's it because like those yeah like car they're not they're not the forty eight cars they they are cattle cars but the way they had them actually set up in real life was like a barracks and that's what they portrayed in this film like you've got your bunks you've got a you know you got a, a heating device whatever you're good to go w- weren't they like armor plated too and like they had like because those trains in that in the, when they're taking off they're very different from like just cattle cars there's no, no, like no, the train or something the cars themselves. Or were not as far as I know, but like the actual engine and like the, the, um, Uh the vital parts of the train were usually armored and they showed that in this film, which was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But like, as far as the cars, cause they they were changed so much. So as far as I know, like they would take the shitty cattle cars that normally they just throw people in. Like Mm -hmm. all all militaries did this in world war one and two, but they would actually take the time to like, be like, okay, well we can fit 40 guys in here and eight, uh, horses, which is what the number comes from. I know you guys know that. I'm just saying for the audience. But they would go, okay, well, we'll just put like 15 guys in here, but we'll have amenities in these cars. So it's like they can travel for a long time and still be okay when they get there. And that's what they showed in this, and it was fucking awesome. It was better than a troop ship, in my opinion, because they also have ventilation. As you can see, like there's a door, and it, you're moving, so you have this like hot, stagnant, shitty air, and everybody stinks. But it's like you still get ventilation and whatever. And if it's cold, close it a little bit more because you've got heaters in there. So, Brian. Yes, uh, I'll start off with this. If you guys want to talk about Nazi trains and logistics, we I could have a whole fucking two hour, fifteen episode podcast <laughs> just in its own. I, I know way too much about it. Uh, but yes, you guys touched on some of the surface elements of it. Um, uh, I wanted to say let's get all the Farby stuff out now because I made a list of everything I saw that was bad. Um, but before and for fun, before that though, so yes, trains. So logistics is very interesting, Nate. And basically, you know, Mike was totally hit the nail on the head. They would build basically like little barracks into train cars, you know, into the sides mm-hmm. of them and everything. It wasn't always this horrible situation for like POWs. As people, everyone thinks, like, oh, we were thrown into to these cars, and then it was horrible and everything. It's like I, I love, I love the Lafette with the gun on that there. Was, yeah. like, well, I've never on, really on, seen on the door that you know? you know, but I did love that they're yeah. all in it and everything. It was so fucking. They, cool. they would have had a machine gun or something to yeah. Like if I, they're yeah, there's yeah. always a machine gun in the background of a lot of these. It's so fucking cool. But uh, long story short, so Europe uses a different gauge railway than Eastern Europe. And when you get to about, I know in the northern part, it's Riga is the real change in Lat- uh, Latvia or Lithuania. I might be getting that wrong, or Estonia, but one of the uh, Baltic states. And then um, down south, I think that the changeover is around Kiev, or that's the easternmost point. So once you get to that point, especially during the war, you can't use European locomotives. The gauge is, I think, half an inch or an inch wider or smaller. It's narrow gauge versus large gauge. So everything has to be detrained and put onto railway cars that are ready for that railway. Talk so about a pain in the ass. Yeah, now try to go fucking invade a country. Yeah. And you know, and use their logistics and everything. And so it's a fucking nightmare. And some areas have smaller 
and you gauge it in that even. So long story short, when they were in Russia proper, they wouldn't be using like a, a Medal of Honor style like armored train because all that stuff was made for like Europe proper, you know, like European gauge rail. And they were converting a lot of the rail during the war. They tried. I think they converted a few hundred miles of it, a few thousand miles at the most, but they never got to where they needed to be. But it was a huge problem. So long story short, they definitely would have been in rail cars like this that they showed mm. in the film. They would have been Russian engines, definitely, probably manned by Hiwis, which were the Russian soldiers or civilians that helped out the German military all over their occupied territories and in Germany proper. Um, but uh, even then, you know, the set is so fucking awesome with the expanse of Russia. And yeah. just how crazy it is in everything. Those uh, those scenes um, when they're on the train where we get like in the interior of the boxcar and it's going from man to man and guys are shaving and eating and such. Um, when you look out the the door, you can. It almost looks like are they actually shooting like in a car, like a, a train car that's moving? Like it looks real. It, it, it doesn't does, look like yeah. a. It doesn't look like a green screen outside. So well, I really wonder where they shot this because they shot it in '93, so not too far after the wall came down. Yeah, so, uh, the probably they could have shot it in parts of Eastern Germany where it was still, you know, they could destroy it and everything. Because some of the apartment buildings and everything look so Soviet, but they also could have been Eastern Europe at the time. Um, and the train car is the first real time that you see where this movie really shines, and it's in the small little moments. You know, because you have all this chaos and this destruction and this black hole that Stalingrad is, this meat grinder you know, yeah. that, that you're walking into and experiencing and getting churned up and, and killed in. But these small little things along the way. And the first one is really with the letter the lieutenant's writing, you know, and how it's like he's alluding to how tender he actually is, even though he's like, oh, this new gruff guy and everything, you know. And especially how distraught he was seeing the old lieutenant all fucked up, you know. Yeah, yeah, kind of an introduction to what's going on. Because he um, really wanted to, that guy gone. Because not because oh whatever he shouldn't be here. Because he's just thinking about oh shit that's me. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. Fuck. Whoops. Yeah, and uh, a bit surprising that even one of the soldiers in the train like says oh I bet you're gonna be dead soon. You know. Oh right when they have the whole fucking uh, bet in a way where it's like oh yeah you're not worth it's like you. you'll 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 be dead before me or something like that. Right. So now that Mike's back, so yeah, I wanted to jump into this. I made a list, and this just goes to show that, I don't know, that you can get a lot of things wrong in a movie, but still be amazing, and in my opinion... We, we've said know, that a million times. Over like, shine. If, if, if it's a great movie overall, the little details do not fucking matter, in my opinion. But so. I, I did keep a list for the hell of it, you know? And it's funny, we've talked about this uh, ourselves not too long ago, but like our ratings have gotten a lot softer as we've done this. Because we just, the more we make films ourselves and the more we watch this stuff, it's like, it is really hard, you know? So you oh, yeah. gotta cut some more people slack. But here's some of the things that I saw that weren't right uh, OT810 half tracks, the Czech mm. half tracks that were used after the war. You see those in Stalingrad proper. They have a turret and armor on the top. T3045s, those are the wrong Soviet tanks. Um, the thing is, is that back then and even today, T3476s are impossible to find. When they're on the train, you see the non-principal characters have East German or West German jackboots on. Uh, they have the rubber soles, and they have no hobnails. Didn't catch oh, that. So, yeah, yeah the, some of the soldiers, as they're talking, they're moving around in the train car. You can just make out their soles. It's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> Moise and PU sniper rifles. That's wrong. They they show up after Stalingrad. It would have been PEs or, um, what is it? PEMs, yes. Uh... Let's see. Um, splinter helmet covers. Can I yeah. throw one out to ask? Um, were in the the very first scene in Italy, are they supposed to be wearing summer HBTs? Yes. The drillish uniforms? No, no. Those are the drillish uniform. The drill. Uh, Jesus Christ, I cannot. Drillish. The fish drill drill uniform. Drillish. Yeah, but they're HBT, but they're those are made for like training and light duty and. Most combat troops were issued wools or the tropical uniform. There, there is a distinguishing difference between the drillish. You see that a lot in '44 at post Normandy and stuff, like pre and post Normandy. At this point, 
I'm going to call Farb on that because no fucking way. Okay. Unless you're in like a work unit or some shit like that, you're probably going to be wearing wools or traps. For the idea of what they're doing, it makes sense that they're a rebuilt company in the middle of occupied Italy. But I, I know what you mean. You definitely see No, no, I, I, I know, I know. Yep. You, you, it, it, you could, I guess, but it's the same. I guess it's the same principle as like, would they be there for recoupment as a battalion or regiment? I see the Wonder Bread Santa showed up. Sorry to hear that. The what? I see the Wonder Bread Santa showed up at your house. You're shitting your ass out. No, it was it was from yesterday. I know, so. but it was just a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, if yeah, you slice the Wonder Bread, you're gonna die, just like I would. So it's getting it's getting a little bit worse right now. So I don't Good. know if it, it nice. feels like that, but you're going into your own personal Stalingrad. Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna, I was just thinking that. <laughs> I was just, I'm gonna <laughs> fall into that fucking. I'm gonna fall into that tunnel, dude. You're on the train ride right now. Yep. That's right. Yep. I'm gonna fall into that tunnel of sewage, and <laughs> you might as well just my life. You might as well just cut the seat of your pants. Flame throws down, up. See. Watch yeah. my flame. Yeah, um, no, there, there's something brewing, but that yeah, was just so so you know. Talking about uh, just that, that that was one thing when I was like, uh, their uniforms seem weird, like in that that opening scene. But then when yeah, they're on I the train, I didn't think that was accurate at all. Okay. For um, whom? Even even for Italy. Okay. Oh, for yeah. That's yeah, the Jewish uniforms. Yeah. Uh, for yeah, behind, I, the, it, it depends. But yeah, definitely by forty four, I, I know for sure that a lot of the nine sixteenth had those because all the guys complained how yes. cold they were at night. They needed overcoats because their uniforms were so thin. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of things. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. what I said. Yeah, but like uh, as far as like late forty two and or mid to late forty two in Italy, um, that's my opinion though. It's not a fact, but I'm gonna say no. Mm -hmm. um so. lp42 flare guns yeah that was definitely wrong right yep. yes that was i actually did catch that one yep. yep um and then the only other stuff i really saw was uh really stupid shit like they didn't f unfold the mp40 stocks but that's something you do in all these films and something though you can really argue but you'll never get this right in a film unless you're super duper niche nazi late county eight parts it's a lot of stamped <laughs> candy eight parts. And if we're talking about Stalingrad, remember November 42, because we made a film in November 43. And you, we call that mid-war, late war. Holy fuck. Was it hard to do the stupid shit right? And like <laughs> you realize that even though it's mid-war, it means like, okay, everything was made at least six to eight. Six months to 12 months before that, if you want to get it really correct. And they've got the laminate stocks like that came out in 42. It's like, nah. Uh, 41, they, but yeah, same thing. And they, but it's this really stupid stuff. Yeah, but like they didn't start hitting the fields until like 42 because they were like, yeah. oh, we're going to see. It's like it's like the stamp parts as well. Like those mm -hmm. came out earlier. And then it's like, yeah, but by the time it gets to the, the actual fighting troops and also the helmets. So they had M42s. Now, now. Just started to show up. Late Stalingrad, they have M42s. But the amount they had in this movie... Too many. Not great. Yeah. Well, and uh, the main character and a couple other people in that opening scene in Italy when they're on their, their in formation, some of them still have the, the tricolor decal. That's not helmet. Farby. Some okay. guys... You see that shit in 45. Some of the old guys, if they manage to keep their fucking some helmet... Some pop about a surplus, too. Just like here. You okay. Are. Well, yeah, but 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 no. That that in my opinion, that's not bad. So okay, like, but the the lieutenant though, he's supposed to be new, right? He's supposed to have just like he's never seen combat before. What Brian just said. Oh, okay. All right. So it might have popped up, or he might have actually requested it because a lot of guys are full of piss and vinegar. Like, oh hey, can I get can I get you know I want all the 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 the, the Reich's colors. You know I want right. everything on my uniform, and then eventually you see it fades, just like his morale and <laughs> you know. I guess allegiance, but, uh, hey, okay. Yeah. But no, that was the, the only that, time I saw it, by the way, I didn't see it yep. during the battle of Stalingrad. No, because by that, like by late, well, mid to late 1940, they were already like scraping them off. And then the, so some factories would still apply them until about 19. Well, some did 42. The, uh, the tricolor decals were gone by pretty much late 1940 factory applied. But like Brian said, they had all these helmets that had already been made. And, and the decals were applied at the factory, so like they would have just issued them out. And in the field, they might have got another unit and been like, "What the fuck are you doing with that? Scrape it off, or you know, right. whatever." Okay. So, so unless not, everyone not totally has bad. one, unless everyone has yeah. one, it's not too bad. Right. That would have been shitty, but like, yeah. no. If there's like one or two guys, you know, one or two times, okay, eighty, ninety times. Come on, do me know what I'm saying? <laughs> Those two get it, you don't. But yes. Anyway, uh, but yeah, no. So, the helmets themselves. 
they threw repros like the beginning like the did you guys notice that like the early stage repros they were being made i don't know where the fuck they were actually made in the early 90s when people started getting into reenacting a lot for world war ii they had a couple of those thrown in most of the shells are original mm-hmm. but they had a couple of these like weird fucked up shaped there's some repros. of the a- extras have ill-fitting ones on yeah and even some of the yeah some of the not primary cast but like not the extras the yeah, but like anyway, so they like 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 the B grade cast. They also yes. wear their helmets yeah. at such yeah. crazy angles of points; it's hard to tell if they fit right or not. You know, that's true. But also, you see that in in pictures too. Like some of the guys just didn't give a fuck, I guess. But like, and also they didn't overdo that because Trevor now it's kind of have a self leveling thing. You know, like yeah, they might be oh, no, forward a little, back, and they're also fitted to sideways your, to your exact that's, head size. You got to make them sideways. You know, like but there's some guys that that were issued a fucking ill-fitting helmet to begin with that don't give a fuck B. And it's like, so you'll see that, but it's very rare, and they also didn't overdo that, in my opinion. But yes, I did see that for sure in this. Mike? So another thing, that because I'm actually, I have the scene pulled up here, the opening scene where they're getting the decorations. Some of them don't have, like the uh, Thomas Kreshna character, the lieutenant, he doesn't have the rivets at all, and some of them don't have the ventilation holes either. Okay, so those are actually border guard. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I just held spit. Give me a second. All right. <coughs> One second Fucking burned. Bitch. He was, he was so offended by that question. I got the shits. I've been hailing. They were borderline. <laughs> they were border. <laughs> so, no, those are the MP3. BGS so much, you know. Yes, yeah. exactly. That's They're the MP3 <laughs> BGS helmets that were designed off of this miraculously, apparently existing M45 design that may or may not have been tested, whatever. It's one of those things, it's like a conspiracy, but like eventually they, the BGS made them uh, ventless, right? There were a lot of those in this film. Also, the color, yes, those are correct for the M35, the parade finish, we call it, it's not a correct term because there was a bunch of different colors, but like the general color they had was the parade uh, parade finish, so it's kind of shiny, um, apple green or pea green, Starting in, yeah, like May or even April of 1940, they started doing the Dunkelgrau with the texture. Well, there was a transition, but anyway, the majority of those helmets in this film would have been dark gray. Okay. The majority of them. Um, That was another thing that I found that I saw, and I'm like, God, they're all fucking green. Which is fine. I love that color, but like, that was, that was, it got to, to me, that was way too many fuck ups because it's like, you can't even just get like regular dark gray spray paint or, you know, whatever. You're, the, whoever was the costume designer wanted everything to look like the awesome. Because again, the German uniform of a combat soldier going into Poland and, and even France in May of 1940 is beautiful. It's it's awesome. You got the nice green shiny helmet with the decals. You got this nice uniform and all that shit. Yeah, but it didn't last that long because A, it was not efficient to produce and B so many guys died or they got worn out and whatever that they would upgrade the uniforms immediately. So in this film, late 1942, the, 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 the German uniform going into world war two and 39 and what comes out in 45 is extremely different from when it started. It's very interesting to see the, the, the difference in just the quality and also just like where the polish goes. That's my two and a half hour podcast that Brian could do about vehicles and trains. (laughs) So (laughs) we're we're not going to get into that, but uh, Brian, especially when you have a very sadistic friend of yours who reproduces uniforms, who decides to make you M45 uniforms and M45 uniform quality and not tell you about it until he gives you your fitted uniform at said event. And as you're putting the pants on, you blow them out. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> he was like, there's one single row of stitch. Yeah, you see? Yeah, it's only one row of stitch. And I'm like, thank you. This is great. We also only have yeah. 10 standard sizes instead of 100. The high was 17 degrees Fahrenheit for that event, which is like negative 40,000 degrees se- fucking Celsius for you people in Europe. No, 17 is <laughs> like negative 10 Celsius. Yeah, but for anybody bad. in Europe, that's like, oh my God, you're going to die. So, was that Bowson? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that. We'll get into that too, and they showed that very well in this film about the whole being able to acclimate to extreme cold. Because mm-hmm. Europeans think they have extreme cold, unless you're in Scandinavia, go fuck yourself. But before we get right into that, um, so speaking of uniforms and all like the you know colors of gray and everything, what I really like about the factory battle is first how they show the viciousness of urban combat. 
and how terrible yeah everyone just disintegrates into it like it's shot so well and just so wide and how the camera at points just sits there and they have like you know probably 30 to 60 guys responding to explosions and i just love that like there's the one scene where like it's like a crowd mentality like they're going one way and then explosions and they go back into the factory like it just i love how this is like many just lost into nothing because that's you know what combat that's what stalingrad really is in a way because the word stalingrad just evokes something you know like even if you know yeah. very little about world war ii like you know for michael it probably evokes two snipers fucking now um <laughs> It just it just evokes fuck you different things in different people, but it's definitely not fired. It's definitely this <laughs> very pungent word. It's like Iwo Jima or Guadalcanal or you know D Day Omaha Beach. It just it evokes an emotion, and it's really like you know it's it's much more than what it was a battle for a city on the Volga. I think Stalingrad was the single worst battle in human history. And I know it's not prophetic or anything, but like, yeah, it's what I understand. It's like the most, the most deaths ever caused by a battle. I think, right. Like 1.2 million. Well, not all of them were combat. It was the elements. Right. It was the lack of food on both sides. It was the civilian toll. My God. And they, they, they did touch on that in this film, a little bit of the civilians that were, when they were driving in the train or riding on the train, rather, and they sell you, they're like, hey, go to work for us. It's like, no, those are people that literally have no place to live because they were kicked out of their fucking homes by whomever or they had to evacuate. And they're just out there in a field and that's their home tonight. Absolutely. You know, it's like, so, in, but in actual battle, because I think, what was the population? Well, it was like 5 million or something like that in Stangra at the beginning, but like before two, was it 2 million? Two, I just looked it up. 200,000 people were in the city. Sorry, 400,000 people were in the city, and 200,000 people were there when the Germans showed up. Of that... Oh, oh I'm thinking of the fucking Leningrad. Of that, Leningrad. yes. Seven... Of that, what was it? Um, 7,000 people were still there in February of 43. Yes. 186,000 yeah. were pulled away to the west. So long story short, they can say at the very least 80,000 people were killed in the city, and 75,000 of them were killed from the bombings. Yes, that so. it, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that too because they didn't show that in the movie, but it did happen, and that's what the first caused thing the all of these did. sets. Yep, that's how that's what uh, calls all that shit. Enemy at the gates. The book opens up the German bombing in July. July, and, and they August fucking went to no pun intended, but they went to town. Like, oh yeah, that it was, was like Rotterdam or any yeah, loof off of it was it was, it was devastating. I mean, it was it was de- insanely powerful, and then yeah, so that and that's what. Because people think of Stalingrad, I think, if they have like any basic knowledge or understanding of the battle, and they think of the bombed out buildings, it's like, well, how did that get that way? It was a, a really thriving city at that point, actually. And it it's was, a very you know, interesting city because, it, do you know how it got? Do you guys know how it got its name, Stalingrad? Uh, tell us. Was it named after Lenin? <laughs> no, Leningrad's up north. It's St. Petersburg. Now you fuck. No, Let him I tell know. his fucking story, you clown. I know, I'm being a smart ass. There was a very big cavalry battle there during the Russian Revolution, I think in 1919, and Stalin was a part of it. And then after it, they gave, they renamed the city in kind of honor for the battle that happened there. It was a big cavalry battle versus the whites. Um, and so, yeah, that's what it was. And it was this very industrious city. It was this revolutionary city because, hey, we have this, you know, very big battle behind us. So it got a lot of funding and it got a lot of, you know, looks. It got a, got a lot of money from the state. And uh, they had a big tractor factory there and everything. And there's a shit ton of industry. There was three huge groupings of industry. There was like oil, big oil company in the north. The tractor factory was in the center. And then the south was like all the grain factory and everything. Yes. And everyone yep. that's ever played R2 knows what I'm talking about. Um, one thing that I would have liked with this movie. One thing I can, if you know, if I'm going to criticize it for something. Um, I understand a movie has to be a certain length and you can only fit so many things and events and such in it. But uh my only kind of criticism is that the once the combat starts, it's like immediately into the shit. Like there's ruins everywhere. Everyone is freaking the fuck out. And it's like, um, my only thing was I would have loved it if there was more of a progression to that. If like we show up or we see like the city as it was before, yeah, bombing and stuff. And then we kind of go into these things that we know about Stalingrad. That's what I would have preferred, but I get it. You have to cut around things and such. They show up in November. The battle starts in 
late, late September, July mid- in a way. Like the battles outside the city okay. start in July, and then like properly they're in the city by late August, early September. Okay. So yeah, that's the thing. It's such a long battle. And the other thing is crazy is that it was the only front really in late forty two that was not receiving reinforcements. So the units that were there were just getting churned in to nothing, nothing yeah. at if all. I, like if if I can make a comparison, like episode one of the Pacific, in my opinion, does a really good job of showing, like you know, fresh as fresh can be, and there's this kind of long waiting period. And over that big waiting period, eventually you start to get into, you know, okay, something happens and something bigger happens and something even bigger happens to eventually it goes into that whole just meat grinder, you know. Um, This just seemed very instant. It was just like, all right, we reached there and then immediately it's like they're in these ruins and everyone, you know, everything is awful and shit. And it's a great battle sequence. But um, I think I would have. What he said, though, makes sense. Oh, yeah, I get it. November. So, yeah, now now it makes sense because I was agreeing with you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, wait, it is November. Mm -hmm. So by this point, you know, the battle basically is already over. The Russians are about to do their big Uranus counteroffensive. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. you're you're two thirds into the whole fighting at all. Like any. I know what you mean, but like the city was already fucking. Dressed. The movie is about fictional people, though, so just have it focus on something. Like have it focus on guys who get there earlier. You, you know. That's, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's. I mean, that's that's just my whole thing. Like I, I would have preferred more of a progression, but and I get it. Like you have to. Yeah, it's a movie. You have to. You can only show a certain amount of things, but um, I always like the slow burn. I I think um. I think to counter that, not not that I don't not that I don't disagree with you, um, in terms of what I would sometimes what I'd like to see in you know more more of a base into these characters and stuff. I think the outlying of the whole entire movie though is to show because of how long they do show it is the grueling toll that you know the battle, but also the weather takes on these guys. Oh yeah, and I think. That progression, because what do you think of Stalingrad? You think of people freezing to death and just being, you know, completely locked in, uh, logistically locked in, uh, you know, to this place because of the weather. And I think um, I, I think that is a huge part to really kind of show. And although I do agree with you, I also think that um, I, I think showing those extremes are very later in the film are very predominant and very brutal which um uh yeah uh, just let me say one thing uh which is funny because in my opinion like there is a 30 minute point in the film kind of right in the middle that where it kind of slows down and it's yeah it's almost like i don't know if to say it went in the wrong direction but there's something that happens to where it's almost like i think it went in the wrong direction yeah it kind of like okay now i'm a little disengaged a bit and then but it starts to kind of redeem a little bit later but yeah and just terms of dwelling on stuff like that in my opinion, it wasn't the best choice. But anyway, Brian, go ahead. Brian, well, this is a good, like, pick up your point where, like, how it gets so brutal. I mean, it goes right into, like, you know, Slaughterhouse 5. You just murdered your friend. Eh, mm-hmm. don't worry about it. I did this. I did something similar. You know, <laughs> it happens in close quarters combat. You know, like, it just goes right into it. Do I have time to deal with that right now? Move on. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's so pick many great up. lines to you here because, like, the veterans really turn to the vets again. Because the guy's like, I thought we had artillery support. One dude goes, yeah, nobody said artillery is close or accurate. <laughs> like, you know, that was a great shit. But, yeah, it's just, um, and culturally, too, you know, it's like, I don't know. The Pacific was such a, a long lead up. Just the theater into things. And it's like, oh, my God, I'm finally here. And then, bam, it happens. While Stalingrad, it's like, dude, the train station's like 100 feet away from the front line. Yes. So, it's just... Yeah. The and then and then um, I'll I'll let Mike go. The only thing that that does bother me about that first engagement in the factory are Michael Bay explosions and the, and the sound tanks. effects. Yeah, We're fire, fire and all that. But, but again, but again, it's the time. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's a product of his time. No, I'm not going to insult the film like that. Nate's bad that he just fell and he fires Kennedy Eight and he spoiled the attack. The Kennedy Eight with the Counter Strike AK sound effect. To get right back to what Mike was saying, it, it does still flow. We're good. Um, the reason I said earlier that I thought the first hour was good and then it kind of lost its touch and then regained it. And I agree with you. I think so. I literally thought this film was 
three or three and a half hours. It does seem from really what I remember. Long. Yeah. No, but no, no, like back in the from like I thought it would. I thought it would be longer, and I think this is one of those. And I will rarely advocate for this, but like I think this should have been about four hours or a two part thing. But like because of the fact that the battle for the actual city in the in the ruins and all that shit was shown. I think about as well as you're going to show it on the big screen, but then it was, okay, we're into the sewers and it's over. And it's like, then we're out in the fucking tundra when they were retreating. And I didn't, I, I thought they, but here's the thing is I know why they didn't do that because, um, artistically and with just film, like you can't stay on one subject and do the same shit for an hour and a half and people still be engaged. And I get that. But I'm bitching about not being engaged because of other things. So it's a it's a conundrum. But they're also not making it for me. They're making it for everyone. And I wish it would have been longer. And I wish it would have it would have stuck on the urban fighting to show exactly how well it did. But like more of that. And like these guys get beaten down. But it's also very quick. I guess it's condensed. So, yeah. Yeah. So I I um no I think that you might be onto something because another good example of what I'm talking about that does it really well is Das Boat, which is a mm-hmm. four hour movie yes. and it does the same yes. thing where it's like okay it starts out very fresh and it doesn't immediately just jump to awfulness you know there is this really big progression and it's interesting you know they put a lot of interesting stuff in it it's not a boring movie mm-hmm. at all and um yeah I just and I'm not gonna say like that's what the movie should have been this movie's bad because of that but like yeah me either yep. just as a preference like oh that would have been interesting to see Brian yep it's had the same producers as uh, Das Boot as well oh really weird they're both awesome they're both bangers I know yeah. right they're fantastic so but yeah you know what I'm saying is like I, I just wish they would have spent a little even though they, the, the unit got there in November I get that the whole timeline but like I wish they would have spent more time on the actual city fighting, which is what Stalingrad is known for. And, yeah. The problem is is that, and I do agree, like, about an hour in, it does lag a bit. Like, right around the time where they get into the sewers and the chick shows up. Yep. Like, yep. it's just, it's really hard to talk about the hell it was. Because all it was forever was tit-tat street fighting. And that's what makes it insane, but that's what also makes it, you know boring at points because i was just gonna say it was really it was good. boring for the troops if fit, you read yeah. The, the, the yeah if you read the, if you read the memoirs from the germans and the russians they said i don't know how many fucking days have passed because it's always the same and well, so to try to get that into a movie it's i don't know how you well that's yeah. what's interesting too like you know you so during the war you have a, a wave on the eastern front for germans and, and russian relations from the german perspective so it's at, at the beginning it's like you're subhuman pieces of shit we don't need you get in the camps, die. Then they really start to fail, you know, fall of 41 towards Moscow. Well, labor's cool. So the kind of things kind of steady out and they don't kill as many POWs. And, you know, beginning of 42, it's like, well, we're kind of in this together. If we're going to occupy your land, you know, things are okay. And then 42 is kind of like, whatever, fine. And then Total after work, Stalingrad, yeah, yeah we'll, <laughs> it gets really bad. It's like, now you're just labor subhuman. But there was a period of time where it was just like, you know, we're just people getting through this and everything. And it, it, we're just combat, you know, your government, my government. And this is just the, the period of time where it starts to change. And I did like how they have like the Russian guy who's bleeding out and how they have that whole experience. But yet at the same time, you see the German dude totally freaked out. It's like, what is this dude muttering? What's going on? Like, you know, I know a lot of, I'd say people in an age bracket where if they were drafted, like, you know, 18 to 22 year olds, if they were in a situation like that and somebody was bleeding out in a foreign language, they would have that same exact, you know, expression, and everything. And just to round up my, my comment, um, this is also the first time when I watched this movie and I did notice some of the, I'd say wooden acting. I don't know. There are a few points where I could tell where it was like, this must've been early on when they started to shoot combat. And because they're not shooting blanks at points, you can tell by the way they're recycling their, their bolts and everything. But like, there's a few scenes where Rolo and all those guys are in the factory and they're just like there. And you could see that like, they're just acting with their eyes, like, you know, like trying to look shocked and everything. And I was surprised to see that for the first time. And I saw more of that than I ever did. So I don't know. I think this movie is the perfect length and they really got enough of everything they needed to do. And the best thing they did is they got the grit and they got the feel of the event 
versus every single little thing being niche Nazi correct. You know, it's like you watch this movie and you're like, I get a little piece of Stalingrad. Fuck that sucked. And that's why it's it's really awesome. The 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 where I think like you guys have said something about like how the lull kind of starts with the sewers and everything. I, I do agree with that to an extent. However, I, I I just like I can never ever not get over the sets and the way things are set up, like the whole like outpost and the abandoned or in their abandoned building, like their entrance point to the sewer, which is like the you know, they go into the sewer through their entrance hole. It's like that whole like thing of like there's two MG thirty fours. There's one in the front, one on the right, there's a radio, there's like a barracks. It's just your set. basement, like, dude. That, Come on. But yeah, but like it's it's just like that's super cool to me to actually see that in the film all laid out because most of the time you just see like you know junk on the bunk and you don't ever see where they're actually set up and it's just really cool and, they, and three cores of them have fucking forty ones and, and they're like, also ducking just, which I love that little detail is they're yeah. ducking when they go by the windows because they know there's a good chance that there's somebody that's just watching that. Well, it, and just before that scene, they. They show that guy getting shot with the PU sniper, which is wrong. The food, the food runners, runners. getting yeah. shot at. Yeah. And just before I forget, yeah. it's very interesting because this film is '93, you know, and there was a few other iterations of the Battle of Stalingrad before this. The most famous one was the West German production "Dogs Do Want to Live Forever," which is a 1950s movie that's really, really good um, for its day and everything. But what I noticed in this was how much of an influence "Enemy at the Gates" had on this narrative. Because you have the boy that shows up and gets killed, and that's a big part of, of the of the book. I'm hold on. Oh, okay, okay. I I was about to say you better be talking about the book. The book I, is the so movie much is its own thing. I'm just talking about the because yeah. that's something that's every in the book. fucking book is better. It, it, you know just... the real it, it. Well, actually, really is from from a Western perspective too. But in this case, like really, Jude Law, go fuck yourself. But um, and the other thing too was the snipers. You know, because, uh, you know, again, after Enemy of the Gates, the movie came out today. Everybody knows, like, oh, Stalingrad snipers. But it really wasn't until you read the book, like, in the 70s and 80s, that was very culturally known. So it's just interesting to, like, see, like, oh, wow, those two things from that narrative are, are big in this, or in a way. Yeah. Michael? Um, I, I'm not an expert at all when it comes to, you know, like, uh, how... Hey, Sean. <laughs> I'm just I'm not an expert when it comes to like movements and stuff like that. I'm only, you know, an amateur, but I do like a lot of the way these guys were moving. You know, they do seem to like care about ducking down and taking cover and crawling and such for the most part. Um and uh, that sort of thing I thought was well done as, as opposed to, you know, most war movies where people are just standing up shooting and stuff like that or just running Which they got to in this one. Right, yes. Yeah. They did in the yeah. next phase. Yeah. yeah. And the the whole tank battle scene. Are we ready to go there? I was at, there are some people yet. running back well, and forth through well, that. Well, there's there's one. There was there was one scene I'd like to chime up on. Yeah. Is that hospital scene? Well, before we get to that, but that that's later. Uh, yeah, that's later. No, no, no that's before the tank scene. I, I, I'll, that's I'll before because they're 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 in the they're in there. Oh fucking, yeah, okay, never mind. Yeah, this okay, is groups. Yep, 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 we did yep, jump yep, around yep, the series yep. and stuff, but uh, it's so once you get to the end of the factory scene, that's their welcome to Stalingrad. You know iteration and everything and then from then on it just the men deteriorate from that period on and physically mentally you know every way shape and form and that's when like in a way the apocalypse now effect takes hold because in a lot of other things like for example band of brothers or the pacific you see guys decay but you can tap out at a certain point now obviously pell you can't tap out in the airfield but there's a certain point where you could figure it out. You can't do that at Stalingrad. It's shoot yourself in the foot and hopefully you don't leave powder burns. Oh, you're going to get found out. You know, like it just, there's no way to get out of this hell. So these guys just slowly deteriorate in front of your eyes. The only times that you ever see them get, you know, brought up back to the surface are again, those little moments where this movie shines. Like when the mail and the food shows up, I have brought hot food to guys at reenactments before in really shitty times they'll fucking suck your dick holy shit like fucking you know one ladle full of like lukewarm soup goes a long way when you feel like shit and it's just was very cool to see those very small moments as everything else is failing you know it's like well she told me twice that she's pregnant but i really wonder what's happening with that cow hope it's okay you know like there's these little things that get you through these horrible situations where 
you're deteriorating, but well, it's things to get you through. I did like that scene a lot. That scene that has the food uh, that shows up, that scene they're getting the mail and things like that, where they're sitting just amongst themselves. That was a really cool scene. A um, lot of good stuff there. I really like uh, the character uh, Muller. Um, calls him Gigi. Um, yeah, you know he uh, that that uh, friendship. I really like that guy. That the was it Reiser is his name. The the, the yes, yeah, he's yep. a great character. Reiser, yeah. Yep. Guy has massive ears. Yes, yeah, yeah. The big he's ear flaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got yeah. Dumbo yeah. ears. But um but uh like and I like that scene a lot where he's you know, he's like, How does this not? He's like, Oh, you just got this little switch behind you know, your ear. It turns your brain off. So I was gonna comment on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I should look at my fucking notes. Oh, <laughs> and he also was the one that said earlier, but it doesn't it won't detract and steer the conversation elsewhere. He's the kind of guy little things like this, I love this, is he goes when the chaplain's giving the big speech before they go into this big, before they go into the factory. And he's like, it says God is, or God was with us on every German soldier's belt buckle. He goes, Oh no shit. Yeah. I never noticed that. <laughs> I love that. I'm like, that is fucking awesome. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's a great moment. Yeah. Because like you, you just think that like everyone knows that, but like he doesn't give a shit. <laughs> you know? I love it too. Like um, the, the old NCO, I can never remember his name. The, uh, the Sergeant, well, that should be like a Sergeant major, but he's a Sergeant. He's a fucking, he's the dick and doesn't buy into the whole shit. He's like, you remind me of my son. He goes, Oh really? How old's your son? Three. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. why. Because you're a fucking child. Yeah. To Gigi, I think it was. Yeah. Yep, he says it to Gigi. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, my son's three. <laughs> those characters were really good. You know, just those those like three. Well, and that four. part of the acting was great because it didn't seem like they were acting. It seemed like they were just genuinely Oh, and also, so this this carries on through the whole movie. So like when they're actually moving through the factory, right? Like they're actually doing that. There's only so much cover you can get in a shitty fucking setting like that. That's why they're all moving to the same thing. Now, the one thing, I don't know if you guys noticed this. People are fucking up. They're tripping, they're falling. They're, there's shit falling off their uniform, like gear and stuff. And it's awesome because like the helmets will fall off and they'll try to recover. And they're also winded, moving like 40 yards. And that's exactly realistic. So, Have you worn hobnails in that type of situation? In cold, yes. yes, not in that. It's not in Stalingrad, but like yes. Well, I, I mean, cement, like in a factory, mud, situ- in a, in a mud with, with type of with situation, solid and slippery mud is, surfaces. Mud, yeah. mud and slippery is one thing. I'll, I'll grant you that. But no, no, no. Like, I'm saying like with metal in there and shit like that. Like oh, it's, yeah. you're but, fucked. Yeah, like, but let's put it like this: like in the field with hobnails sucks. Walking on concrete and flat surfaces sucks. But when you throw pebbles and, and rubble and gravel like into the mix on a flat surface with hobnails. Yeah. You might as well take your fucking shoes off. <laughs> and I did it's love that. so bad. Yeah. Dude, I it's, have ice yeah. skated so much. Like fucking at events. <laughs> I oh just, my God. I just, I was just reminded of something. I'll tell it real quick. Oh boy. I, story time. <laughs> yeah. ice story. I was, I, I was doing, I was doing GI reenacting. And I remember doing it in like an abandoned factory. We were doing like up in Ohio in that area. And there was an abandoned factory. And <laughs> I watched I'm I'm like hiding behind like this corner and all of a sudden I watch I just hear like yelling and it's 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 Germans running around the thing trying to get in cover and stuff. I watch one run full sprint into the factory from the outside in, tries to stop, can't stop, <laughs> slides, <laughs> literally ice skates straight into a locker <laughs> and you just hear shit wham <laughs> then fall over and then you hear watch out there's fuck no Wham! <laughs> like another one, back to back. They just fucking eat shit in these that lockers, is... and it was like someone tried to put the brakes. It was like Home Alone, you know, socks on wooden yeah. floors, <laughs> like so. That boom! Is like quintessential <laughs> like Looney Tunes moment right there. Oh, it was two of them <laughs> straight back to back. I I took my hit because I was laughing so hard. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I'm out. <laughs> I was like, I'm, they that know where so we funny. are. I'm laughing um, so hard. It, and you, uh, obviously, Nate, you weren't there, but we were making Reveille. Uh, Myra was in charge of the Airbnb we were all staying in. She was so adamant. I would say, everybody, take your boots off before you come inside <laughs> because you will yeah, destroy. Yeah, hobnails will destroy your wooden yeah. floors. Yes. <laughs> also, what yeah. was cool about the sewers, too, is it reminded me a lot of Canal, of the sewers and Canal mm. and everything. You know, and it was a very interesting, I think, in a way, almost a nod to that film. I'm, I'm guessing that was just straight up raw sewage he fell into. 
Was that was that that was supposed to be? Yes, that's what Mike is currently making. <laughs> is that what the yeah, toilet the looked big, like when you were done with it? Bat. Thomas Thomas uh, Kretschmann there's fell little, into like, it. There's a little dragon figure in his toilet. Ah! It's getting <laughs> quote unquote better. <laughs> there's a German pioneer with like a you know a little flame coming out. Also, one six dragon guy like on top of the bowl, <laughs> lifting out the lieutenant. No, I, and like speaking of that too, is like um, back in the day, I thought I was like, "There's no fucking way an infantry guy is gonna be carrying a fucking flamethrower." And then when they said they're Sturm Pioneer, right? And they're actually another great detail they got right was the Waffenfaba on the uniforms. Mm-hmm. They really did for all the units, whatever. And so they were in black, and I'm like, "Okay, yeah, they would have them." Those guys just had like all this. Sh- they're demolition experts, basically, and they portrayed that in the film, and I love that. But yeah, it's the sewer also, I wouldn't be using a fucking flamethrower down there. I wouldn't much less shoot a fucking gun down there. <laughs> While we're light, light that methane, yes. Right. <laughs> While we're on the point, I will put in this week's sticker trivia, as Mike brought it up. So yes, in the film they mentioned that these guys are Sturm pioneers. What exactly is a German Sturm pioneer? And what's the Western equivalent? It's the first person to message that to the group, uh Gets a sticker. Let me ask this though. Um, the the I guess he's the the villain of the movie. That one officer who keeps fucking with them gets them arrested and everything, and they eventually kill him. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Was he yeah. artillery? He seemed to have red. Not on police. Him. He's police. got orange. Chain it's dog. Police. Oh, okay. Fell gendarmerie. Yep. Okay. Yeah. No, he's, he's like an MP. So of course he's the villain because fuck MPs. <laughs> well, it, if it you're listening them. to this and you're an MP, <laughs> I stand by that. You might be a cool person at heart, but you chose to do one of the worst. Fucking MOSs Fuck and professions you, in the military. That's every yeah. Oh, well, I've already had this conversation <laughs> with Trey a million times, and he agrees halfway. But he's also still got his little fucking MP f- pride, I guess. And whatever you did your thing. You gotta turn yeah, he, he's short. an M- he's he's an MP. Don't cut all that out, Nate. Don't cut all that out. How you doing there, buddy? <laughs> yeah. How you doing? The Germans buddy? used mm-hmm. to call them chain dogs. In the war, because they had a corset that they would wear. Yep. And they had a chain around the neck, so that was the... That well, that was, was once we were on duty. Well. That's the equivalent of the MP patch nowadays. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, like, when they're on duty, they're wearing that, and if they're not, they're just wearing the orange and being gay and being assholes to everybody <laughs> that they're fucking comrades, yeah, literally. apparently, with. If you ever had a reenactment and you see a guy doing Felchadarm, run away. Yeah. This book that I've read about the 352nd uh, at Omaha Beach, uh, they, they talk about in it a number of the uh, testimonies from various guys that... that the Feld Gendarmerie, or however you say it, they were like they absolutely hated those guys. Like they they couldn't stand Dude, them. It, it, it's every combat armed soldier in every fucking military mm-hmm. hates MPs mm-hmm. because the MPs are the ones who join. They go, I wanna I wanna police my comrades, right. and I wanna make sure they're doing everything right. It's like no, the units of police themselves. If they're being if they're being stupid, Mike, you can't piss in Iraqi mouths. Okay, we had this conversation. Oh, a while ago. <laughs> oh, don't don't fucking. Okay. <laughs> it says here in the Geneva Convention you can't do that. So you know. I'm just. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take a breath. <laughs> that We're was good to go. That was the goat. That was that no, was that the was, goat you did not take. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, but MPs yes, okay. are hated by. <laughs> every fucking soldier I've talked to from every military in the world that I've talked to, fucking, we all agree on one thing. Mm-hmm. The food always sucks, besides the U.S. Air Force. And MPs <laughs> are the fucking bane of every military, and they fucking suck, and whatever. And if you're an MP or a former MP listening to this... Well, if you're an MP in the Air Force, what do you do besides, like, writing a lot of speeding tickets? No, 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 no. You're not an MP in the Air Force. You are security forces. Yeah. Oh, that's... You get, like, the handcuffs no, that are, like, fuzzy. They're, they wear berets, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> they wear fucking berets. They're special. Yeah. Oh, we gotta, you know. Ed, fucking clowns. MPs suck. I stand by that. Please, <laughs> Nate, do not edit any of that shit out. Because <laughs> okay. a lot of MPs, former and current, will, they'll be like, no, actually, yeah, we do. It's it's a rivalry. It's an inner thing rivalry. It's a so to get back on track. I'll get us back on track <laughs> to deflect from the fucking thank you pissing on fucking detainees. They're not they're not prisoners. <laughs> they're detainees. Well, it was a midwestern unit that was at Abu Ghraib. I do forget. So. It was actually yes. You're correct. <laughs> you're correct. So anyway, um, yeah, the the that officer who also. 
was way too old and also he never got promoted through the whole fucking thing. I guess which not. in Stalingrad it's like it's like when we when we do an offensive, a lot of guys die, a lot of guys get promoted very quickly. This guy was such a piece of shit that even his own the Wehrmacht or the Heer did not promote him. He was a captain the whole way through. And yeah, he played a piece of shit. Did that help him? No, but it's cool, though. It It obviously was not bulletproof. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, when they killed the animal the first time. (laughs) Right. Wearing the rank on the outside of those jackets, especially in Stalingrad or somewhere where you're, like, going through uniforms and, like, you just don't give a fuck. It's for the movie. But, yeah, so he's, he's he's an MP officer. Okay. And and I did okay. So the part that I did like about this film, that like um, I think, uh, uh, um, um, uh, Generation War, they wanted to make like the army on the Eastern Front look like they never did anything. It was always the SS and the SD and all these other whatever in the Ukrainians a lot. But no, the army did do that kind of shit. Yeah, on the Eastern Front. And when he's Every sitting there and he's did. like. Not yeah, exactly. And and he's like, you know, hey, I don't want you to kill that kid or whatever. And he's like, get the fuck back in formation. I mean, this is like abridging it a lot. But like, that's realistic. And I like the fact that they like, they didn't show them to be villains. They just showed what happened. Yeah. Just... And it's like, because the, the Soviets have done the same shit. Yeah. Because they did. And it was like, the point I want to make earlier, it is still relevant now because like this carries on throughout the whole movie is like when this war broke out, the Germans viewed the Soviets as subhumans and they committed a lot of atrocities, which provoked the Soviets into going, Oh, we're going to do the same shit does not make it right. But that's how it was on the Eastern front versus like Western front battles. It was, there was more of a chivalrous. No, nah, not really. It was, but it was a less. A better term. Yep. Yeah, correct. Yes, I agree. And like, so like, if you listen to Dan Carlin, a hardcore history, really good podcast. It's well known, but like, he did something on the Oz front, and and that really resonates. Is like, on the Easter front, it was they literally hate each other so much because it was a snowball effect of like, we're gonna do this to you, and then we're gonna do that worse to you, and then oh, we're gonna do that worse back and forth and it just really didn't seem to ever get better on the Eastern front. And then you see the results of the fruits of the happening um, when they, you know, Soviets actually got to Germany in 45. But in this film, it shows that like they're both brutally, both fucking just are doing this because, and they're scared of like the atrocities that they might experience or whatever. But then there's that one time, which also is definitely documented that they go, hey, we need a, a truce for just get our data or our wounded out of here. Yeah. Like, just can we just 10 minutes, 15 minutes, let's just fucking stop shooting. Um, there was shit like that a lot. But yeah, it was fucking nasty on the Eastern Front because of that, because of that aspect. So, and this is just right when it starts to really get bad and relations on the front are horrible because, you know, it was really bad for the guys that were in Stalingrad. It was also really bad for the Soviet POWs that were inside of Stalingrad in POW camps, you know, because those guys just literally starved to death. So there's a really, really interesting um, YouTuber called Tick, and I think I brought him up before, but he has this amazing series about Stalingrad. It's like hour long episodes. There's 51 of them, and it just will blow your fucking mind away. He spent four and a half years making these, and it covers every single aspect of the battle. But one really cool one that I rewatched for this was the one on food. Where basically he has a, a plate where he, he shows you the, the ration of a German soldier before and after. And it basically starts out with a whole loaf of bread, like a whole loaf of Wonder Bread for people in America. And then it ends up being by Christmas 1942, uh, like two pieces of bread and a sausage, if you're lucky. And mostly horse meat. Per so day, like, by the way. Per day. This is per day, yeah. So it turns yeah, into this like is not a meal. sandwich. Yeah. So you're getting. You're losing like four pounds a week, basically. And you're also, it's negative, it's negative calories, but you still need the vitamins and the minerals from the food, but you're burning more calories digesting the food than you are gaining. And yeah, that's, it's fucking awful. And and this is when it turns into the crazy factor. Um, Well, I'll bring it up later, but you know, a lot of 
the reason that a lot of the German POWs died in Soviet captivity is because the airlift kept them strong enough for long enough where it weakened them so much that once they eventually got to Soviet captivity, so much was spent from it that the reserves they initially would have had if, let's say, they were captured in late November or December of 42 that would have made sure they lived, just killed them off. To the rate where if you were taken cap- if you were taken um, prisoner by the Soviets during the war, you had a 32% chance of getting killed or dying in Soviet captivity. If you were a Stalingrad German POW, you had a 95% chance of dying. Yep. It's four, Only, yeah, 4% chance of surviving. Yeah. So yeah, it's 4.63% yep. chance of survival. And, but that mostly comes down to the fact that these guys were on the end of their reserves and the Soviets were starving too. So, yeah. But before we get into like history and shit, let's talk about um, the hospital scene and then the tank mm-hmm. scene. Yep. And then we'll do your history and I think IMDb. And then, um, and then I want to talk about one more pivotal scene at the end of that. So. Which, where's what, the what, other pivotal scene? Where does it fall in place? You'll in find movie? out. Huh? You'll find out. Okay, it's near okay. the end. Well, we'll, get through, okay. we'll go through the movies yep, and we'll we're do good. history and then we'll do IMDb. Sorry. Let's, so. Yeah, let's yep. go ahead. Yep. So in the hospital scene is fucking interesting as well. Not only because they use an MP40 mag as a splint, which I think was really fucking awesome. I didn't well, he didn't that. have his MP40 anymore because... Well, but they used spent mags, though, which I thought was cool. So, no, but, like, even, even if it was full, it didn't yeah. matter. Like, that's it's, it was a great touch. Yeah, really I hadn't was. noticed that when I watched it before, and now I'm just like, yep. I'm going to remember it's that. It's a great touch. Very it, fucking It works. Cool. Yep. yep. And the whole scene, he just kind of plays into the rest of the movie with a motive of, like, no one cares about individual life or the wounded. They're in that whole sequence, you know, because you see everybody else that's dying in the pain and, and so horrible. And the doctor didn't give a fuck. You know, he's just desensitized. He he's just, you know, it's like the like some of the worst episodes of MASH when the guys are just like, oh, my God, this is a meat factory. But it reminded me of a quote from Stalin, not necessarily for World War II or for Stalingrad, but, you know, yeah, I know a single saying. death is a tragedy and a million deaths is a statistic. And it's just like when you see so much destruction and, 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 and whatever, who cares? This guy is literally dying in front of you and, and you don't care. You're like, I want this to, you know, be pr- something has to become of this. This is crazy. Why is this guy taking a gun and doing this whole s- like a, a bridge too far situation? But actually it went really bad, <laughs> you know, because there's that a very similar scene in that film. So but it just goes to show that it's like no one gives a fuck. You're just in a meat grinder. It, no one cares. Fuck and they go, they go to that Peel Battalion, which they actually portrayed very well because people think Peel Battalions were just like wave uh, units that they would just send to their death and like whatever for no reason. No, no, no. They would do shit like they showed in the film, clearing minds on both sides. It wasn't, it wasn't just one side. It was like, okay, you're going to go here for X amount of days or whatever. And then the Germans happened to need soldiers faster than the Soviets. And they were like, okay, well... And that's, I'm really glad they, they actually showed that aspect of it too. I, I've actually never read any German memoirs or, or any really too much in German penal battalions. I have read a lot in Soviet ones. And yeah, they were very like formal. Like you'd fuck up with something like, oh shit. Like there was one guy who he got the wrong orders and you showed up to a wrong unit and they like sent him to a penal battalion for a month. And like, you know, you just served out your service. And a lot of times they got new equipment. Like it wasn't like this bottom of the barrel kind of thing. Um, you know, and it's like, well, you go through it. And, yeah, I think they did do a good job of that and how they just got their rank taken away. But, you know, they, they were still soldiers. They were still fed. They were still in this shitty situation. The the one thing I did like was showing that showing that uh, that tension between, you know, the lieutenant, the lieutenant and the guy who was like who pretty much was like, I'll fucking get you in trouble. And he like beats him like that guy. He she showed that. Oh, like, at the, be- at the beginning. Up. Yeah. Yeah, like who that guy who's like I, he's like I will report you. How dare you? You know you like that. And then he like, you know because because he's now he's not lieutenant's now no longer to, has to be respected because of rank. He can shit on him. And I think that's very interesting. It also shows that he has like an iron cross at this point. He's got a forty one. He's controlling the bread. Like it's 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 an interesting dynamic to show that that like say please bitch. You know like it's like. 
There. It's very interesting that they went there. And then it gets blown in half by a tank shell, which I think yeah, is that was fun. interesting. Yeah. There isn't and I like how they did that. They like buried him into I the know, ground. That, He's just like that ah, was kind of funny. Ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is an interesting aspect with rank in this film because they they kind of like try to be like, I'm one of you, but clearly you're not a soldier. You're you're not an enlisted man, but it's like I'm in the same train car. I'm with my I have to earn the respect of my men. And Yes, he does along the way, but Rank plays this funny thing of like, well, it's it's only useful when you really need it. So you have all these other officers, and they're like, you know, we're here for the honor of Germany and the honor of stopping bolsterism and stuff, and it's like, oh, well, now I could use it, you know? And it's like, Yeah, but it also air- showed that it doesn't actually fucking matter when the lead starts flying. No, no, because- it doesn't, but it just shows how some people at points will be like, well, this yeah, didn't they matter before, that. but yep. eh, yeah, just how shitty people can get in bad situations, you know? Rats will always try to find their way out on a sinking ship. You know, everyone, when mm-hmm. things eventually disintegrate to the point where it's like, oh, oh, this is what's going on, you know? It, it, yeah, it's, it gets really but what, bad. But it did show Anybody it as like, there was, in this film, and a lot of films do this very well, also the same amount shitty, but like, is, it doesn't matter what you're wearing on your uniform. That matters in garrison, when you're doing a fucking parade, you're giving out awards. Okay, who gives a fuck? Well, like, look how shiny they are. Like that one right, but say. in combat, it's and it's still true to this day. If you are wearing the rank of whatever lieutenant, uh, whatever, and nobody has confidence in you, nobody's going to fucking listen to you on the field. Nobody, and they showed that in this film with like that captain that ended up being one of the characters that was kind of weird and like he got fucked up physically and mentally and everything, but he. he um, he was the guy that was like calm, cool, collected, and going, all right, hey, all right, go here. Yeah, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, because they're going to react this way. And then, bam, and people listened to him. And the lieutenant, when he was initially there, nobody gave a fuck. And he also was like, oh, shit, what the fuck? This is retarded. But, like, um, it showed that dynamic very well of, like, just because you're wearing the rank does not an expert make you. Like, and so I, I love that in this film. And then once he starts proving himself, like, well, I'm not going to try to get you all killed by making stupid choices. I'm going to listen and learn from the guys that have actually been here. Then they start listening to him. And it's like, that's, that was a really, again, that was a very like kind of, um, um, small detail, but like it was, it's, it's very accurate to most militaries. So, yep. But um, yeah, you know the uh, the tank scene as well is just fucking when they redeem their you know rank in a way you know or their honor if you want to say that is just so great. And if you just look up this movie on YouTube or something, there's like a few scenes that obviously are clipped that are watched a million times, and the tank scene is probably like the number. But you one. think it's great? I think it's very well done for what it is. Oof! Oh boy. Oh, we have a disagreement? You don't? How else would oh, you yeah. do it? It's a bunch Eight. of infantry guys trying to stop armor. Okay. I mean, in reality, so, armor would just drive around them. Who gives a shit? Okay. That was one of my main points. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. For, for, the movie, for the movie, it makes sense. For reality, it's stupid. Mm. Okay. So how... Okay. I guess the conversation should go this way then. How could they have portrayed it better? Because I think it was completely fucking retarded. Have a choke point. You have a choke point, but like they didn't. It was just like they were in an open field for mi- half dug I mean, fox for miles. Holes and yeah, no, it, yeah, and like hasty positions and all that shit. Yeah, but like, and then they're using okay, they might not have had like anti handheld mines. That was common, I know, but like it's for okay. what it is, it's good and it's interesting. It's infantry combat fighting tanks, it's the wrong tanks. Again, you know, if it was a Russian unit, they would just well, drive okay. around and go say to the, the next settlement. Say the right tanks. I know the tactics sucked. Um, some of because them did, they came some into of them, didn't. them sideways, and then they turn at the last second. It's like well, they have tank if, riders. They're getting close and everything. I mean, I did like some of the aspects of it, like when they used the treads to to destroy foxholes. That happened every now and then. Running over German soldiers. That happened every now and then. Um. <laughs> You don't have to worry about it in the winter, but in the summer, when you run over someone with a tank, it starts to smell after a while. But in the winter, everything is frozen. So guts and things, it doesn't matter. 
the Eastern Front, you, you have some of these things in tank battles. Um, the guy getting blown in half. I mean, obviously that was a little. That's a little goofy. You know, crazy. Yeah. You do hear about that at rarely. It has happened before in combat, but again, the I, the things that have to happen for that to to occur are just well, yeah, insane. it has to do with the way it's but, depicted. It, but yeah, as so, far as German soldiers holding off tanks in the winter, I mean, it is a good job. The better one, in my opinion, is uh, it's not German soldiers, but it's from Talbasota, the Winter War, where the Finnish soldiers hold off against the Russian T twenty six tank attack from the 1989 movie. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. They fucking like, they stop it with a fucking, uh, the finished panzer faust, which is a log in the tracks. That's a really cool infantry verse tank scene. But as far as what they're trying to do with this, I think it's, it, it, it's good with the packs and everything else. I mean, you could also engage those tanks about 500 meters as well and knock off a few of them. They kept I mean, missing. And like, a, that's the thing is like, it was, uh, it was made for a film, I guess. A hundred percent. Yes. But what, what they applied to the film, I think it was cool. It's not like when you have uh, the Forgotten Battle, where it's like you have all this really cool shit in the same fucking place, and it just looks horrible, and it just is really retarded. But in this, it's like you have all the stuff in one place, and it's used how it should be used, mm. at least for how they're depicting it. So that's that's I think the big difference. Okay. So yeah, no, I I I, I think from what I'm from what I'm gathering is that. Mike's not exactly happy with the way it's presented within the film, but I think I hear what you're saying all around. That's what I was going to say. Was that, is, like, I think I yeah, for what it is on the film, I think it's great. I mean, like I wish we like, yes, would six tanks choose not to charge infantry in the one long gun. Yeah, absolutely. They would just sit back and shoot. But in terms of a film and its engagement, I mean, if they had to take it out, they would. But I feel like the engagement of getting up close and stuff, yeah, that's definitely film. But, it, you know, it, I, I think, I think you know, in terms of the actual engagement, you know, unlikely scenario, realistic or not, I think it is, um, I think it's a very interesting, well done interpretation of a situation that may never happen in terms of that because te- like as, as i think what mike's trying to get at is that as a tactical uh it, d- d- depiction it doesn't work and i i think i agree with him in that sense in terms of a film depiction uh i i like it and i and think i think it's interesting it's real those are real fucking tanks it's even yes. today yeah. where t-34s are a dime a dozen i mean relatively it would be really, really hard to recreate that outside of Russia. The scene, like, yeah, it's fucking awesome. The scene is the the scene. The purpose of the scene is to have our characters redeem themselves by doing some of the bottom of most bottom of the barrel kind of thing, and that's it. It's like we got to do this where they have to take out these tanks. It's going to be absolute, absolutely terrible for them. Um, so that's what it was in terms of a. Uh, filmmaking you know for as a as a plot point yeah that yeah um, for a plot and, push that's what it's for i, I yeah. love to how even the tankers have the correct black uniform on because mm. that's something you don't hear about you know what did you guys think of seeing the uh what's it called the half holodon being used the handhold mines that was neat yeah. yeah were those used a lot like would the would they have used those a lot they were they were in the field okay yeah. and for pioneers it makes sense they would have them okay yeah, they're used more than you think. And the taped um, together grenades too. Yeah, I know. I saw they had those, a few yeah. of those. Molotovs. Anybody can make those. Are in a handbook. I mean, and Molotovs are really effective against tanks. People, what people don't realize when they see tanks is they get afraid because it's this, you know, weapons behind armor and you can't destroy it with a weapon. But if you stop and think about it, you can always scare the crew. They're humans inside a box they can't really see out of. Well, it's like to stop and listen. And literally, a, a correctly placed Molotov will destroy a tank. Oh, I've always heard it that. It doesn't take much. I've always heard that Molotovs were one of the best ways to, to yeah. fuck up a tank, you know. They're using them now in yeah. Ukraine, like, to take out fucking tanks. In the beginning, they were using yeah. Molotovs. Like. like I mentioned a minute ago, like, the Finnish Panzerfaust, did you take a stick and you stick it in the tracks, and you have the tank just get stuck and go crazy, and then the crew will eventually come out and you kill them, or you burn them out. During the war, my favorite anti-Panzer tactics, you, you fire a smoke shell into the tank and it will hit it and stop on top of the armor and the ventilation system will suck in all the smoke. The crew thinks they're on fire if they're not really too experienced. They'll jump out and you machine gun them and you take out a tiger. It's like you think outside the box or you do the same thing with a Willie Pete round. Like, you know, it's not hard to scare them out of it because fire is what they're really afraid of. And if you make them think they're on fire, then they're fucking jumping out of that thing fast and you can fucking... You know, 
I don't know. But your analogy here, Nate. Hey, do you want to be? You want to be in a in a in a square shaped cauldron, or do you want to? Shit you know? through goose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I I think going into uh the the next couple of scenes, I think near the end. I mean, like, I I I think the the year, although as dramatic and everything, which we, we, I guess the movie interpret it. Ha, ah, can't speak tonight. I think what I think the whole airplane scene is really interesting. Um, you know, the whole failed getting out of the of the encirclement. I think it's really interesting to see. It might be a little bombastic, but I can't think that it wouldn't be that like stampede. I feel like, you know, people it, in a panic are always the most dangerous. So there's a lot that goes into it from the historical spin, like, you know idea it's really good as far as it's shot and it kind of condenses the whole feeling and this again is, another se- another scene where music is way too loud yeah it's kind of like the the opening scenes of saving private ryan it's like this kind of sets the narrative for the whole of stalingrad because people are like oh my god you know nobody can get out on planes and it was so horrible and everything and it's like the airlift was was, was a whole conversation in itself um but towards the end yes there were people that pulled rank and got the fuck out of there but it wasn't as crazy as that, you know, as it portrayed. There were a few different airfields that they were flying people into and out of. Um, one airfield they couldn't use because Palace had his fucking, it was actually Gumrock, had his whole fucking um, ed- headquarters there. And they actually couldn't use the airfield, so it was really stupid. Um, but it's a good scene, but it's not necessarily, like, exactly as it happened. It's, it's a bit too bombastic. And by this time, too, by, like, you know, December, January, they were really only dropping supplies in. It was very rare that they would get people out because it just the, the weather was really bad or most of the airfields were overrun. Um, it's a good scene, but not necessarily. I, I don't know. It just where they're like, it's like they're like having to hold people back with guns and such. And it's like if you yeah. if you made something like, you know, you're at Henderson Field and people are running for a plane to get off of the island because it's going to follow the Japs. It's like even though it's like, you know, oh, it's September. Or I don't know. It just didn't. Yeah, I don't know. It's a little bit too crazy if you look at the real history. But it's cool. I did like it, it in that scene though. They do talk about like the doctor going like, "All right, can you go? No, you did that to yourself." And they shoot the guy, which is I've never yeah, heard. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That well, yeah. execution. That was but. that was uh, in my opinion a little too much. Well, it, was, it and it's funny because later on the the police guy is. He's like begging them not to kill him. He's like, Germans don't kill other Germans. It's like, really? I've seen a lot of it in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because, like, by that t- time of the film, it's almost like the baddies are wearing the winter zook or the two piece German. They kind of like to differentiate you know? it that way. And it's like the good guys are wearing, like, you know, mm-hmm. oh, they're wearing the overcoats and the good old fashioned Wehrmacht. You know, when we line people up and we shoot them, we just don't shoot them, you know, when, when they're in the stretcher. So, um, and, and also for, I forget, I do love the winter shots and how well it's framed. Like I was thinking about that this time, like they really do great wides yeah, and get the most out of it and really make you feel in an expanse, almost tying like it back part. into when they're in the open before the city fighting, you know, when they're going on the train right. car, mm-hmm. well, that's it's almost what it like is. this like, nice, like, Oh, we're out there again. Like uh, in a way, most Dr. of like Shibazo, Eastern like, Europe and oh. Western Russia is just, the steps just it's just like the mm-hmm. flat whatever and that was really cool and like <clears throat> if you think about it like a lot of the there's still like bone yards out there mm-hmm. bone fields they call them yeah yeah bone fields and like it's a bunch of the retreating guys that froze to death because they have nothing they're fucked you know and like that one scene where they were uh driving in the truck and they're watching like just German soldiers being burned in a pile. It's like, yeah, they did that because they were like, well, we, this is again, dead weight. After the battle, they just made fields. I mean, there's many well-known ones that diggers mm-hmm. go to and they dig shit up of just bodies. Yep. You know, the spring came around and then it was, there's no, everyone's starving. So no one has the energy, you know, and, and nobody's going to do shit. So just, it was right. the way that it went. And that reminds and it was me awful. Yeah. Oh yeah. But like, if you got to think about it too, at that point, the environment that they depict in this movie alone, let alone the reality of where these guys were in 1942, is so insane. From, again, that Italian coastline on the train to burning bodies on the step. Like, the movie is very dynamic in what it shows. It's kind of almost like, in a way, Avatar. 
because you just get such a big range of environments and situations and things you know it's just usually you just get like field or interiors and it's like oh that's that's what it is but no this one's a you can definitely see the production value like we keep talking about the sets and everything it's like it's fucking it's really good the scale yeah. is massive it's not just this crazy battle you know in russia oh it's cold and it's open and it's a city it's just like well and the reason i think you're saying this is because da, like da, 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 you can you can tell when it's a fake snow setting but like the ability to like have the camera angle that fucking wide when you're filming on set in like a snowy environment which there was less snow in real life or i'm sorry in this film than in real life but still it gets the effect across um it's really cool because when the snow blows it actually blows into like a mist right which it it does in reality and it's not it's not like snowing necessarily but it's still there it's like a lot of films are like in order for snow to be there it has to be actively snowing no no no, it's bullshit it does not and so they portrayed that very well and i'm pretty so do you know where they actually shot the winter scenes from what i looked up it was looks like it was in finland maybe during the winter yeah i would it must because yeah it says here um production on production that Shot in several loca- locations, including Finland uh, and Italy. Mm-hmm. So they must because the fit because that winter looked like a, a lot like up here, mm-hmm. and it's like so it must have been there. But like it, it, it was real. It was a real winter. Yeah, it wasn't fake. And snow. You see these guys like, yeah, exactly. You see these guys walking through actual snow and wind. That would have been and a production like, nightmare. I'm sure it would have sucked. Oh fuck! Yeah. I can't imagine like. Just sitting out there for a half an hour, you're done. Oh yeah, that would have sucked being in, like on the set. Yeah, but, uh, and the gear too. Like in '93, like they were, just, like Nate said, they're probably shooting on film. Yep. It's like how the fuck 100%, do you? Percent, yeah. Oh man. So yeah, it's I loved it. Like when they got to that point when they were like, "We're deserting," because that is actually historical. That is a fact. A shitload of the guys, if they got out from the encirclement, just. We're like, fuck it. I'm going back home. Like, I don't know what I like. I'm dead either way. I'm going to try to go home. So, Brian, how many documented cases of guys escaping are there in the pocket? I don't know at all. Honestly. I could probably count it on one uh, hand. I don't know any. I would guess. You can. How many? There are two. Two. Wow. One might be fake. Mm. One is from a guy who said right. he was from a flak unit or him and 20 other members from his unit struck out from the city and over the course of two months made it to the Hoff's Panzer Army, which you got to remember at the end of the siege, they were 250 kilometers behind Russian lines. Right. Like right. the expanse is fucking insane. That's me um, in the winter walking to where Mike lives. It's a that, pretty like, bad. To, go, to go back. No, no, no. I would say to go back to Germany. I should have specified that. Like in order to get back, it would be me walking to Mike's place in two feet of snow with negative 30 degree weather. Yeah, fuck that. How far the fuck, how, how far am I going to get? <laughs> mm-hmm. Not very Not far. Not even out a of bunch your of state. Italians that did it too, which is the crazy thing. They walked from fucking the Volga to Kharkov in some cases. Mm. Insane. Right. That's, a, but, that's um, nuts. Yeah. So, this, so, that, so one of them apparently made it back and he was at a field hospital telling a story and a mortar shell landed and blew him up. They think that might be a fake that was created by the, the German military just to be like, look, people got out. The real one that they definitely <laughs> yeah. know happened was a guy, he was in the 100th Jaeger Division, which was a light German uh, infantry division, and he volunteered to be a translator. And he rose with a Russian unit, and they got really close to the front line, and he ditched them, and he was able to make it back to German lines. And he 100% is real. And he wrote a memoir and everything after the war and it confirmed. So, so there really so is one. He's really only one guy that did it. And he got, he mm-hmm. did get captured and he was able to finagle his way, like, you know, with Russian help back yep. into it. But there was, they said that there was fighting at least until late March 43 in the y- city. Yeah. Because yep. there were pockets everywhere and stuff. And the Luftwaffe every day was looking for pockets and guys they could drop supplies to. And it's funny, in some memoirs, you'll be like, and Lieutenant Porco or whoever took four men and, and tried to make it out of here and they took a vehicle and I don't know what happened to them. And now because history and everything, there's like some Soviet memoir and be like, towards the end of the siege, some fuckers drove in a truck towards us, we machine gunned them and then we took their watches. And it's like, oh, well, that was the end of Lieutenant Porco where this guy and his <laughs> other memoir they wrote in the 60s has no idea what happened to them. And, you know, and it's like, you can piece these things together. Um, 
Yeah. But uh, yeah, no. Yeah, it it's fucked. Crazy. Like once they were once they were encircled, which they showed in this film, they were fucked. Seven even, even days of encirclement. Yeah, and they they had. Um, I guess he was trying to play Apollos, right? The the general in this film. But he was like, yeah, they're they're doing this right now, and if they do this, which they're probably going to, we're all fucked. And he was completely correct. The German officers were great. The high command sucked so much ass. It's a lot like the French, and the, the Germans hate the French historically, right? But they're the exact fucking same because Paulo's asked for help so many times. They're like, we can't do it because of a like you mentioned earlier, like the rail systems. We can't. We can airdrop, but like whatever. And they just let's, ignored him. Let's hold that because that's a whole conversation. We'll put that right at the end before we talk about guns. But yes, okay, so okay, we'll, okay. We'll okay, get okay, to okay. that because there's a sandwich. Yep. We'll, we'll, we'll okay, talk about all right. It, but. I, I do want to talk about the uh, uh, just a few scenes near the end, like. I like, like, Brian was talking about little moments and stuff like that, like the air dropping of chocolate and iron crosses. And <laughs> yep. Like, I, I love that. Like, unfortunately, oh, yeah. it's, it's you know, it's it's wrecked by Gigi's death, but, like, it's just it's just a very unique moment. I love the capsule that comes down because it's all yeah. vintage looking and everything. Like, you never see that, you know? Right. And so it's just, that was really cool. But then, like, you know, other than, you know, the rape dungeon, like you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the bottom. Which turned is out like, a lot know. better than I thought it would. It was more. I thought it was more realistic than not because yeah. Right. No. No. I I agree with you because that really happened. That that that, yep. that did really happen within. Uh, oh, uh, but like ab- yeah, but, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But like, but like, I I I. I, I love, like, how he hoarded everything and how everything is just there. And it's just, like, and how they all start feeling a little bit more human somewhat. But then you also still see the 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 the, the, the breaking of, of themselves. Like, I love it when Otto is just whistling and putting on another yep. record after yep. he's broken it. Yep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I love that. Like, like. It's like that record died for that scene, but it was so cool. Like well, there's you know, a lot just, of them that were just. Shit. I love how he like reads it too. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know? yeah, oh, cool. It's, it's a love song. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's if you right. Yeah, if, yeah. The words it, it's, are well, like I love yeah. that. I just love like how like um, uh, Richter's not Richter. Rolo's taking a bath in a wash tub, saying like, "All right, well, after the lieutenant goes, like, who goes next?" And like, all, like, like this, this familiar, and like, you know, hey, the the ace of clubs has like, yeah, it's Trump, a that's a Trump it, card, saying, and, or Trump, because yeah, they're playing yeah, yeah, like with, uh, Trump, yeah, the, they're playing like euchre, kind of. It seems like, but it, that's an American game. It just seems game. really, it just seems really, really. It's just a very interesting take. You don't see that in many yeah, movies. Exactly. But it's an homage to the beginning of the film too. I'm sorry, what? It's an homage to the beginning of the film too, because it was like you're back in the yes. good time. This is what they expected. They made it to the Volga, you know. And it's like oh, until you get Russia. the fuck out of that mindset of like, okay, well, no, it's actually not that bad. Like here, we're just playing cards. So the whole reason why I bring up the scene is to ask Michael a question: Was he able to see the the wonderful timing of of uh, Otto's blood splatter? <laughs> it's the whole reason we have to talk yeah. about this. This I- is. This is historical, no, dude, like, man. Th- very rarely does any movie ever like depict that well. But anytime you gotta have someone blow their brains out, you gotta have the, you know, and all that. Right. So, but it's like you know, it's it's it is just. It's so off. It's not even. Yeah, it's biblically. It's, uh, well, you can tell that like the squib is in the chair. That they were just like, you know what? We're not filming this again. You get the idea. You know. Yeah. One one take. Imagine right? if it was the second like. <laughs> quicker though it would be also, it yeah like, the gun noise it just looks like he right, shits himself <laughs> <laughs> yeah so whoops it's a, a good a good over a second yeah delay. it's like uh yeah uh, it's like it's like his head hitting the back is what set off the squib everything you know? up to it everything behind after it's great but the way right. the chair rocks yeah, right. and everything and they, well, the crates the are really of, bad too. The gun the sound effects, like, I, I think yeah, his like movement, his movement is what set off the squid, <laughs> not the gun. So he, here, here's what it sounds like pulling a PO8 out of your. Go ahead, Mike. Jacket pocket. No sound <laughs> at all. Oh, weird. Yeah. Weird. Weird. 
But besides that, yeah. I might have to, like, take away the red in this scene. I'll just make it brown. Suck, start a POH. Like shat off the wall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, like, yeah. seriously, it's like, I actually, and I hate the fucking movie, and we're going to have to do it eventually. Well, we'll do it soon, I yeah. guess. Is Full Metal Jacket, when Pyle nails himself in the head, <laughs> that is one of the most realistic spatters. There was no round going through, chipping the tiles off, which would have happened with a 7.65.1. But that the timing and everything was actually and just the way it was like kind of ex, an explosion and not like a splat i guess that's one of the most otherwise yeah films fuck it up all the time yeah one of the worst is in downfall uh, when we do with that movie that's that's another one of the worst. Yes. up there oh the guy in the subway uh, yeah he's it's like bad. Uh, and like yeah. the, the he does it through the his the roof of his mouth but then the blood splat is like behind his back like what yeah, the and hell? It's, there's a lot of those in Downfall, like yeah. that I remember. Like again, it's one of those things. Like I don't care about it because the movie itself it's is so great, good. But like yeah. I, yeah, it's you just yearn anyway, for a better um, depiction so, of it, right? So these guys, like that guy, he's just fucking had enough, mm-hmm. right? And does that, and now we get to the point where they're all kind of done, or not kind of, they are done. Did- I think the I think the ending is is very 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 poignant and very everything and I'm glad it ended like that and not like they, they find a, 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 a you know, they someone like finds them and they're able to get out of there yeah and they get captured or like they get gunned down like they don't get gunned down they freeze that to death. Uh, well that that last shot that the movie holds on with that it's almost like that almost again what I was saying that this movie is definitely you know trying to be you know dedicated i think to some of the german soldiers that fought in the war that final shot is almost like a monument you know it almost seems like a monument to the you know these guys sitting there go ahead brian if you think about it it's such an apolitical film too because up to this point everything when you talked about these subjects you had to have a heavy hand of just be like well you know nazis are bad and this that the other thing you know because the, the way that they rebuilt the german West German government, at least. And at this point, remember, you know, Germany as a country, East and West, is a very new concept. They're, they're still integrating. So, you know, the way the West rebuilt their government was honoring the resistance members, people in the July 20th movement and, and stuff like that. It just that's like, look, there were people that lived through these situations that said no. Um, but this film just really says people lived through these situations didn't say no and it fucking sucked and they need to be remembered too. So it's so great how it's like these people fade. You, you go through all these horrible events and then the best way to, to end it is just to have it end. <laughs> you know, like these guys just trying to get out just like so many thousands of these stories in Russia did end, not just at Stalingrad, but you know, all, all over the place. Oh, Leningrad was and nasty Richard, as well. Cassie pocket, Rajev, mm-hmm. the meat grinder. I mean, you know, there's tons of, of these fronts that were just, just really horrible. But um, it's just very interesting. So there's a few points I want to talk about. I'm going to do the history, and then we can go right into IMDb. Uh, German time. They kept mentioning that in the movie. I thought that was a really cool touch because that's something that you hear about mostly in Eastern Front memoirs. But they would set everything to German time. I know that was the thing that you hear in Normandy as well, because French time was German time. So there was only one time in the German Empire. <laughs> it was whatever time it was in Berlin. So that was really cool to see. Um, the Russians were playing a very, 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 very cool song at one point while they're um, they're like across the street from each other. And I don't know if you guys caught it or not. It's not Katusha or anything. It's actually called Dark is the Night which is the best Russian front song ever. It's like a folk song about, you know, you, you're going to live a week, so who gives a shit? And how bad the front is and everything. And it's, I was really shocked to hear that. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, just the POW, I don't know. Again, I think her character was the weakest throughout the whole film. The female? That's the female, you know, it's like she's more of a plot device more than anything Unf- else especially Sucks because she's german big. and unfortunately russian. a lot of female characters in war movies are you know the, yeah oh yeah you know so. not not many times do you find someone uh or some how many times worse. can you fuck another sniper yes you're right 
Uh, yeah, this unfortunately female characters they never really in war films usually never get like you know any kind of perspective. Right, you know, they're there for something the males to focus on. This is basically basically like Steamboat Willie too, like. <coughs> and then in the factory battle, they had the one scene where they were like they removed the guy's tag, and they're like, "Oh fuck him, he's gonna die anyway," and goes away. That well, he was is like one of those scenes where it's like I think it's a little bombastic. Do like, you think so? Yeah, yeah, like he's just, dude. It, it's again, it's like this film's great except for probably like three times. So you're like, you're oh, okay. you you could die four ways. Combat, your own guys, the elements, and the, like, being captured and all that shit. Really tall Russians. <laughs> He's fucked. Well, yeah. What? <laughs> right. The Shrek, the, the burned up Shrek coming at him. The, the tank battle. Look at that. Oh, The tank yes, battle was yes, great. There was yes. like, shoot the big guy. Look at that. <laughs> that, that part where that okay. guy's lumbering forward, I, I didn't mind too much because, like, that's some of the kind of crazy stuff you hear from, like, the Battle of Stalingrad of just insane shit that you wouldn't even think about an ogre out of a factory basement. I mean, just crazy fucking shit like that, you know? So no one else agrees. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, no, I agree, happened. but like, I'm still hung up on the dog tag thing being on like bombastic. Cause I don't, I don't think so. like you go, you're fucked dude. Like we're going to leave you here. You're fucked. You either get killed by our guys. Yeah, you leave you here, but like, why are you going to break his tag? That's just like, you know, that's, that's your dude. Cause he's fucked. Know. So that's somebody else's job. That's a, he's still alive. I don't know. <laughs> no. Okay. 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 But yeah, you don't break someone's tag. Like that's a. It also might have been like the military. last chance to motivate him, I guess, and then he didn't take it. And are we I in the know. SS? I mean, it did, no fucking Christ, Brian. Like no, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> the SS were so hardcore. Now you have to know your them. blood group tattoo. I'm gonna rip your tag off. You die now. I guess he's a Viet Cong guy too. Yeah, but um. <laughs> comment on the accent but you already covered it so we're good <laughs> so well, the last thing to talk about before we talk about uh the weapons is the history and mm -hmm. like i mentioned earlier you know stalingrad just the name evokes a lot of emotions and it's a very misunderstood battle due to a million different reasons but to put it just in in broad terms the germans had already lost the war by this point the Germans didn't have the manpower, they didn't have the ability, and they, the Russians had enough time to rebuild their military. Stalin trusted his generals enough, and they caught the Germans on a bad footing and were able to have this victory. It was a one-sided victory. The Germans were all fucked up. They didn't have their best footing with their military, and the Soviets were able to take advantage of that. It wasn't until Kursk, where the Soviets for sure show the Germans that they were able to destroy them. But this battle just goes to show that the Germans missed the opportunity to knock Russia out of the war in the fall of 41, in the winter of 41, and that this was just a continuation of a campaign that couldn't exist. The Germans either could have gone for the oil in the Caucasus with one fell swoop, or they could have gone for a northern wing to protect the Caucasus with one fell swoop, but they attempted too much with too little and overextended themselves. And that's basically the battle all summed up. On top of all that, the big problem in Germany at the time was that total war had not been installed. The Germans were still fighting a war with a civilian economy. And the big reason they were doing that was because the generals and the leaders had a fear of the First World War and how the economy had just gone to shit so fast and destroyed everything. They wanted to keep a footing that was mostly good for the public, but also were fighting the war. Stalingrad starts to happen. They know it's very going very bad this is november of 42 the german government needs a reason to convince the people that we have to go to total war the war is going bad they were going to do it anyway but this is the perfect situation to convince a war weary nation that you have to dig even deeper and that yes you might have memories of the first world war and the blockade and everything but we have to win this this isn't a campaign that six months in france six months in poland six months in scandinavia this is real war now and by making Paulus a field marshal and wanting him to die in a stake and remembering the men of Stalingrad and that doesn't happen and that you can surrender an army and you don't have to die for the Fuhrer and die for the nation, this is the crack. This is the beginning of the end for Germany. So basically, the Soviets were able to win because the Germans overextended themselves just a little too much 
and weren't able to cover their losses because of previous manpower losses over the previous four years. And the Germans couldn't convince the sixth army to be their sacrificial lamb to buff up the morale of the nation to get really into the total war. So it's this massive turning point. And on top of everything, you have all these things. We can talk about the airlift and that one third of all the Ju 52s were in Stalingrad and everything. The allies were now in the full swing in the West. Operation Torch was happening two weeks before Uranus even happens. Most of the supplies are getting sent to North Africa. Like things are fucking crazy. So everything just comes to a point where the Axis have already lost the war. And beginning of November 42, things just start to steamroll. And by February of 43, you have Stalingrad, the end of the battle, two or 100,000 German POWs. February of 43, you also have the Battle of Guadalcanal coming to an end. The over, was it, 50,000 Japanese soldiers die. And three months later, you have Tunisia fall, also known as Tuni- Tunisgrad. So within six months, you have the three biggest turning points of the war. And the Axis can never regain the ability to win. But Stalingrad is the beginning of that. It's the first crack. It's the first time that they drop the ball. They don't have the manpower to regain anything. And they're just the end of their brittle spear. You got that shit right. That's basically everything summed up. And this movie uh, does a pretty darn good job of covering most of that stuff. And you're going to get a lot of shit in the comments. For an overall summary, not bad. That's the truth. And again, it's such a misunderstood battle because a lot of it's Soviet narrative where it's like, we let them get this far in the country because, yeah, we're, we was a plan. And it's like, no, Stalin didn't trust his generals and the, they had enough space to bumblefuck for a year and a half to then yeah, but, yeah. regain their footing. And Shurikov held off long enough in the city for, uh, what was it, Zhukov to be able to build the reserves for the ring operations. Like, Enough stuff happened. And, and like we all know, it's never – in war, it's either one huge thing where, oh, my God, it's a battle of Tannenberg and everything's fucked. But also, or Brian, this is a, a, this is a 10-hour cuts. fucking podcast to go into details well, about this. That's why I said oh, – Well, that's why the battle is – you know, it's so well, misconstrued and we can talk yeah, about Yeah, that's the thing is it's, it's a 10-hour of like – yeah, anyway. so Because even when yes, this movie good. came out, the Russian Soviet you know archives hadn't even been really investigated yet and looked into. So even our narrative of the battle has changed over the last 30 years. Yeah, and they're all, the Soviet archives are fucked up. But like, uh, Go read some yes. David's lands. <laughs> Good overview mm-hmm. for our purposes. We'll say that. We still have IMFDB. All right, Commence. ready when you are. Let's do it. Okay, uh, can you scroll yeah. any <laughs> fucking slower? We don't need to see the, <laughs> the, the contents. Oh, Oh, f- <laughs> me. come on. You didn't have to set you. You had to open your mouth. I was going down. Now we're going to get there normally. Yes, I always open my fucking cock holster. And, uh... <laughs> P38. Yep. That's nice to see. Oh, man, check out that face. Mm. Rookie Mesh. Also, Rookie that's a repro helmet. But, yeah, go ahead. The look on this face, man. That's like a reaction that I should use on Facebook or something. <laughs> when he wake up in the morning with no coffee. When you got the when you got the gluten shits. <laughs> I'm actually I should be okay. Don't curse me, you fuck. When you hear Mariah Carey Christmas no. music. No, so based on the size of a P thirty eight, that chick is tiny. She's as a little thing, yeah. <sighs> tiny. Yeah. Saving your career one step at a time, Brian. The POA, yeah. <laughs> German officers usually meet that's a fallacy. Like who the fuck wrote this one? Because uh, uh, oh, in, in the film they usually okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Nope. Well, the problem the problem is with this is we go down. I don't like the pictures and I don't like what they used. It's, it's not. Yeah. You talking about this? The, the page. The MP. Dude. The page. Yeah. yeah they, they barely have any descriptions at all. They just na- na- have the character's yeah. name. <laughs> ah, Otto. Yes. Yeah, the LP. They don't uh, even LP have a description. For that. <laughs> no. Michael, you know what you got to do. I know, I know. I've done it before. <laughs> Next time you get your 9 to 5. <laughs> uh, MP40. I didn't see any of those. No, none of that. Not at all. No they did hold up like 70s 40s. fucking war films, like Patton and shit. They, they had a lot, a lot of the same sound effects, but like also they, 
they just held. Yeah, that. like you said, no no stocks extended. It's like that's what I did and love about Generation War is they used um, what's his name used it like they were used, and mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah, so. splinter covers too. Just a little too early. Would they have any cover of any kind? They definitely would have them in 1942, but like again, don't very new. Really see them? It's I mean, 43, they're all the rage, but this is okay. Just a they would have had like burlap or like hung, they would have had Hungarian covers. Okay. Yeah, you see a lot of those. Yeah, the because Amoeba the Hungarians were covers, there. You kind of see. Yeah, they're all those yeah. muzzle yeah. close up. I actually have a Hungarian cover. Nice. I bought a, a, a legit ago. real one, like a, a World War II one. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like, those, those are fucking rare as hen's teeth. Oh, yeah. Tons of these things. Apparently, they cut up some of the amoebas, too. Yeah, P41. Papa yep. Show. It's very cool to see how many there were in this one. And that is recorded and documented. Yeah, you can see and photos I of it. I believe it because it's a far superior submachine gun to an MP40, especially in cold. For an urban-style combat warfare, absolutely. Yes. Yes. But again, a submachine gun's got its purpose, and that is its purpose. So that's why I think it's superior. And trust me, I love the 41. I will praise it. But my God, would I not want to use it if I had to hit someone like 100 yards out? I could probably hit someone. I don't like the drum. The drum is very much always in the way. The sticks are better. Veterans preferred the sticks, the ones I've talked to. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, was there yeah. lighter to carry? Well, so you always have the six-inch pie dish in front of you. <laughs> But if you're in, if you're in combat like they are right here in this picture, like you're gonna want the drum because it's less reloads. If you have to go, oh, into you a want house. the drum, yes, but it just bulk, it's hard. It's the same. No, no, no. It's it's a like bitch because the they're. Thompson. It's like earlier I was talking with one of my guys on Discord, like sucks. about an AK drum, right? I'm like, yeah, it's if you want to inflict a shitload of casualties, very close range, a drum is a good thing. You can rob a bank in North Hollywood. Here, here's the one thing. They're great. The drums are awesome, but you have to make sure you have ones that actually fucking work with your gun. That was the linchpin for the PBSHs, yeah. The that was ones. the problem with most of them. It's like you could pick up a drum, but who knows if it will fucking work or well, work. So was it like AK, AK drums where it's like you can load them once or twice, they'll work great, and then after that they start having problems? No. No. It, it, the problem they was is that like guns. it, it like the, 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 the machining on the drums sucked so bad yeah that they were never all the same like so like for example like i've messed with 41s where like i've tested like 10 drums and only like two would fit into one and then i've picked up another one and three would work or five or nine or eight or two like it just depends on the machining of the drum because I think it was I don't think it was the magwell with the forty ones that was the problem. It was the machining and the and the stuff for the drums that were varying. And the problem was is that they they also had problems with like feeding and sometimes it would work well enough. Like pretty much the rule is is that if you have a forty one and you get mags and drums for it. Always mark them for whatever one they are, because okay. once yep. you find one that works flawlessly, it will work flawlessly. But it's the it's the ones that just when you are picking up secondaries, thirds, or whatever, if the magazine doesn't match the gun, sometimes they just don't even work. Um, one thing with these with PPSH forty ones. Um, now this I don't think this really has anything to do with performance, but one thing I have heard about them is. That I mean, guns are loud no matter what. But I hear that PPSH forty ones are like insanely loud. Is that true? Insanely really? loud. Okay. Yeah. Very yeah. high velocity. Just, just round. because. Yep. Yeah, it's a high velocity round. It's a seven point six two by twenty five. You're also shooting at a high cyclic mm-hmm. rate. And if you're in a building, oh my yeah, god. Yeah, because I mean, like, guns are loud it's no like, matter what. But I hear that oh. the, those ones specifically are like way louder than a normal submachine gun. I have been around. That same one I talked about, the Germans sliding into the foot into the lockers, like on the hobnails. There were guys running around with forty ones, because uh, they that's how they got around not having MP forties. They they captured them on the Eastern Front, whatever. Those things are so fucking loud in the building. Oh my god, ring your bell. I, even with earplugs on, the concussion on them is so bad. Really quick in this photo, I'm noticing those helmets are the correct Feldgrau. So. They repaint them like halfway through, like production, or maybe, 
What the? Because like, yeah, that's that's the correct hue. Uh, <laughs> and the guy on the left, it's not a repro. It's a fucking that's, small. That's GG. Yeah. And it, it's that's a GG it's a really too. small helmet for him, and like that would not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Carry on. A lot of the Soviet helmets looked very off. They the chin straps were not what? SSH forty helmets. What? That's a that's a, that's that's a just, helmet. He's cover. got a cover on it. He's got a cover. Yeah. It just looks very odd. Yeah, so it looks like an FJ so helmet, but it's it's just got a cover weird on it. Weird angle. And it's yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I don't recall scenes. The Soviet helmets were shiny a yeah. lot, like gloss. Not not just shiny, a gloss. God, that was oh, that was so cool. Sexy. Yeah. That's so sexy. <laughs> Oh, I don't recall any guy. stick mags being used. Nope. No, I didn't see it. It's all drums. Yeah. And what I noticed about the K98s is a lot of them did not have clearing rods in them. Or cleaning rods. Nope. Yeah, none there. Like that. Yeah, like that one. Yep. Most yeah. of them in the film did not have those. And I was I like, bo- is there a reason for that? Because it's... Oh, okay. So I, yeah, was, that... I was looking at the guy up there on his shoulder strap. I thought I saw a hook like right there, but that's his Y straps. Uh I saw yep. something else. Nothing in the chambers. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, every single one doesn't have a cleaning rod. You're right, Mike. That's what I noticed, and I'm like... Yeah. I know I know, yeah, a, a lot of, of guys would lose them or whatever, but like, at least one or two guys, I think, maybe would have them. It's always one. The, the Moisen the Nagat rifle, yeah. The Moisen Nagat. Mm-hmm. Moisen Nagat yeah, yeah, sniper... Yeah. PU. It's not even prizes. a real fucking sniper rifle. It's fake. No, that mount is fucked. It's <laughs> yeah, right to the scope. It's and the scope, the scope the is scope. fucked too. Yeah. <laughs> Just Look make something that. that looks right and put it on there. That's what they said. They did. They use like See a. The they. Oh my god! They used a fucking PEM like repro mount with a. Sh- it's mad. a civilian that, that's scope. Made. That's a civilian that's scope. That's like screwed into the side of a wood. Yeah. That's like a Bushnell even... scope. I'm not shitting you. Like, look at the look, look at the uh, elevation knob. Oh no, 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 no! It's a ZF4. No, it's not. It's a Dude, check ZF4. Look at the fucking knob, it's the a elevation check CF4. knob. Yeah, I know. It's a check ZF4. They had they had like the neural, like the not neural, but like uh, what the fuck do you call that? Like the big. Texture? I don't know if that's a ZF4, Brian. It's, it's a ZF4 variant for sure. It's it's a post war. Uh, it's a, like a Bushnell, like yeah, a fucking. Wow, yeah, so that's not even... Huh, okay. That's not even wanna, close to being a PU. How wrong do you want to be? It's definitely... And, it, and, and his rear sight's elevated up to, like, a thousand fucking meters, so... If you want to get technical. Now, this is yeah, what I mean by the Why do you use the, the Panzerlauf image? <laughs> that's, why I, yeah. that's why it's annoying. <laughs> it's a check ZF4. Yeah. No, it's not. Dude, the knob's the exact same. Look at the tube shape. It doesn't. It, it's the exact. The knob's the, the exact front. same. The two. It's it's the angle that makes the tube look wrong. That's a check ZF4. Okay. All right. Whatever. I, I, doesn't matter. The knobs are the exact same. <laughs> okay. The, the knobs. How same. many scopes have those fucking knobs on them? Oh. Okay. Wow. This is Brian's STG44 muzzle nut. Discussion. No, well, dude, yeah, Brian. Well, Nathan, look you at, were wrong, but I'm right. Look That's at the, the fucking. <laughs> look at the fucking tube ZF4. shape. <laughs> How the how the like it, it comes yeah, up on both CF4. sides to be equa like to check CF4. The, no, it's okay. Whatever, it you're an expert. Yeah. Oh my god, guys. Yeah, check. In this okay. case, it's check CF4. <laughs> check. No, it's not. It's look at the look at fucking tube photo. shape. Look at the photo. Yeah, and I'm looking at it, and it's yeah, not the tube, the tube shape on a check ZF4 is symmetrical <laughs> on the front and the back. This is not the angle. It's the there's no, there's none of those like risers. It like, it ha- I don't know the terms, but like it, it goes I'm trying to find like this it. instead Apparently, of the two scopes. In this, they made two scopes in the world with the same exact knobs in the same exact location, and it's it's check ZF4. Oh, uh, ZF4 I, I'm, I don't care about this part. fucking argument, but you, you're you are incorrect. <laughs> I'm not correct, but I know That's you're a check incorrect. Check ZF4. 100%. It's not. It is. It's I, not. I, uh, it is. You sent me the fucking picture. <laughs> it's not the same percent. goddamn scope. It is. <laughs> Same exact scope. You sent everybody the same fucking picture. <laughs> yeah. No, no. It's... Oh, it is. Dude. Mike, he's he's from Connecticut. Look at the front of the scope. Just, Wait, okay, just look at the ZF4 front. You even have a ZF4 scope. I know I, I don't. I have a fucking 1980 or 1980s or 70s ZF4 scope. And it does look like the picture you sent me because it's fucking the same size on the front yeah, and the back. This ZF4. That is a check scope. It's the angle. 
Hold the hold your scope at this angle. It's not the angle. Mike, we're not gonna win. It's not the angle. Because you're you're both wrong. <laughs> to check CF4, hundred percent. I don't I uh... I'm going into paint. I'm gonna circle this shit because I don't know how to fucking do it any Just go grab your scope and look at the angle. I don't have a ZF4. Check ZF4. So don't tell me to go grab something I don't have. I also have a German ZF4. I, I don't have a check one. Same, so. well, that's the same exact scope. So it's just a check. No, it's not. A check no, it's made not. ZF4 and a ZF4 are the same scope. Oh. ZF, a ZF4 German does not have a a side adjusting knob. Yeah, it does. I sent you a German no, scope not. in that fucking image. A check ZF4 and a ZF4 are the same scope. It's just, this is a post <laughs> Michael, Michael's, 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 Michael's doodling with something. <laughs> Let's, no, I'm not. Let, I'm not going to waste fucking time because it's it's so let's retarded. Let's move on because we're gonna we're yeah. gonna we're gonna Connecticut stubbornness is we're, yeah. It's we're it clearly that. a German scope. So. Okay, whatever. No, it's not, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> it clearly is a ZF4. Like it's okay. fine. All right, it's, it's a fine. ZF4. Let's move it on. You're a fucking retard. Fine. But like, at, um, <laughs> MG MG34s. Yep. are not pans. Those early ones or late ones? That's a Czech MG34. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm oh, fucking with you. Go there. ahead. I see the it's joke. Not. I was about to. I was about to, I was about to argue you. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> there is a thing of that. That's a check MG forty two. There is actually there is actually a check MG thirty four. It's just I don't. I this is the only time I see this. Th- I, I remember this thing was on the train. I don't remember it being used in the battle or anything. The forty two. The forty two. No, the forty two was on the train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that at this one. point they're brand new. They might have been yeah. So. They made it to El Alamein. I don't know if they made it to Stalingrad. Don't know. Well, this one probably um, didn't either because it was just on a train, the transport. So who knows? I think there is evidence of them actually being in Stalingrad, and I think they actually had a forty-two in one of the bunkers. I think they would have had the thirty-nine forty-ones, which is like a mini MG forty-two, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah, the tank. Oh, the DT. Yeah. Which we yeah they kept like uh, mirroring the image. Oh, I didn't notice that. Just like <laughs> yeah. yeah, yep, yeah. It's the wrong side of the hole, bud. <laughs> oh yeah, that's where the driver would actually be. Uh, right. Yeah. But that was late for ones. I don't know why they <clears throat> picked that picture for this, but yeah, the nineteen ten thirty. Yep. It's a little early for an SG. It it is, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's like the forty two. It's like a couple of them could have been there, well, but. I, well, Probably not. I think they were adopted like in the fall of forty three. You see them a lot in forty four. Yeah, but like go up, go up, Nate. So the SG forty three was a yeah, it was the the thirty. So like the upgrades, like the forty three version of the SG, like maybe probably not, but like the this well, the other right crazy there. one, which is the one that Nate couldn't figure out a few months ago. Um, this one I think it it I think they made it to look like a Maxim. Cause see how it has like this thing on. Yeah, the right shield, here? the yeah, and the and yeah, the, yeah. Well, no, the shield, but they also look but like the, the, the pipe water hood, water but it's faked. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah, a, it's yeah, just yeah. a pipe. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Because the bore diameter um, is way bigger than a fucking. Looks like a bad Maxim from that angle. No. And grenades. Hey, look! They didn't use the the, the bad hole, one, yeah. Mike. They, they used the bad one at one point, though. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Training. Somebody, somebody that I know used it, but. <laughs> I had no choice, but <laughs> that's a training one right there. That right there. Yeah, with the holes in it. What the, this the, one? The bigger bottom. Oh. Yeah. Oh. The baton yeah. racing he did. Yeah. The. Uh, the. I did like the seeing the ones tied, tied up together. Ones. Yeah. The Yeah. Yeah. The one in the movie looks different Tank. from that one, though. It almost looks like the back of a Panzerfaust um, warhead. Yeah, it probably was. Well, they, no, they, so those things are they're a shape charge, right? And by this point, even they realized that, and that's what Zimmerit, like the coating on the tanks, right. was made. The Soviets never used a magnetic mine. They would usually throw these two, even though they're very heavy. They would usually like kind of chuck mm-hmm. them, and they would like stick onto huh. the engine block or whatever. That's a yeah, it's a. It's a half that's Panzerfaust. A, that's basically. what it looks like. That's a fucking yeah. That looks like a mortar. It's just interesting because Mike. It's Mike different is right. there. It is different yeah, it's, from the, than it is right there. Yeah. It looks more like the back of a Panzerfaust. But it, I think there are a few different models. Okay. Of it. <laughs> it looks like a looks like a traffic <laughs> cone. Yeah, it does, it, but it's literally half of a Panzerfaust. <laughs> yeah. 
You look yeah. at the, it's a Klein ahead. It's so basically, if you took a Panzerfaust, Panzer just stuck it on the tank and fired it. That's, that's what it the would same be. Same exact concept. <laughs> yeah. Imagine someone doing that. A little hot jet of copper never ruined anybody's day, right? <laughs> they had a little smaller version of this that looked like a little Panzerfaust you would throw. Oh. It would hit the tank. Is that the thing with the with like the fin on the back? Okay. Yeah. You see like GIs are like, what the yeah, fuck? Yeah, I've seen photos of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's always one of those capture items where they're like, what? There's a story from uh the twelfth SS where one of those was used in Normandy on a Churchill. This guy like put it on the side of the tank and was running away and it fell yeah. off. And he looked at his friends and ran back to it and grabbed it and held against the side of the engine bay until it exploded. I think I've heard that story. So, um, so the magnets, I think I might have told it here before, the magnets weren't the best. Well, magnets, bitch! <laughs> Good reference. They, all, well, they showed that in the it film. Fell off, he yeah. It fell off, yeah. He puts it on yeah, there yeah. and there's, it fell off. There's, a, you know, the British um, 74 grenade, the sticky bomb? Uh, with the, the, the case that... Did they make it with GI socks? <laughs> <laughs> Don't even, you fucking SPR fanboy. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, there's great footage of in Italy of them trying to test those things. They throw it against like a, an Italian tank uh, that's knocked out and it just falls right off the side and explodes. It's, it's a fun concept, but they never worked very well. well they have those gamma grenades too that was like the bag. Oh, yeah, I've played Medal of Honor Airborne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know about the gamming grenades. <laughs> the f- the flamen yeah, the th- Oh god, yeah. The massive explosions. You throw the mm. hacky sack into some guy's crotch and yeah. explode. It's the only way you can take yeah. out the tigers in that game. <laughs> or the or the or the armored MG forty two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 SS with the, with the <laughs> gas masks on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Often yeah. Storm Elite, I think is what they're called. <laughs> God, I love that game. <laughs> uh, Flammenwerfer. It was interesting to see. At least done well. I love the arrows on the they show where it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's right here. I do that ironically. Ding. I'm like with thumbnails and shit because I'm like, Ooh, look at all these fucking arrows. <laughs> it's, it's so fucking they do that for clickbait, you know, like uh, you know, notice this new thing. You know, that's yeah. that's that's why yeah. I do it. Yeah, it's funny. Or I think it is. Um, Black 38. Yeah, one of those sitting yeah, out there. Yeah, just sitting there. It's a prop. It's not even real. Um, 45 anti Some of these might have actually <clears throat> been things sitting around from the war that they, you know, put out there. Oh, 100%. Yeah. It's a yeah. long boy. Yeah. Yep. Pack 38. I love those, so those anti-tank guns. They Dude... The amount that they missed <laughs> was from irritating. like five feet, five feet away, right there. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's like, dude, at five hundred meters, I can see that a bit. Even though these guns were made to go out that far and actually penetrate mm-hmm. the sides of the fucking T thirty four, even the eighty five, eventually they could. In this film, it's like they miss every shot. I'm like, that's fucking retarded bullshit. It's a smooth bore cannon, like. <laughs> It's just lobbing cannonballs, basically. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's just like, Jesus Christ. And they got to drag this fucking thing. It's like, no, leave it there. You're done. You know you're done. Um, T-3485. Yep. Is this the tank that was in the Beast? Oh No, it's no, T-55 it was... or T-62. Oh, no, it was in, okay. it was in um, White Tiger. Yeah. What have we that, ever seen? This that I fucking, you ever seen that one? Yes, I have seen White Tiger. I think this is the one that was in there where the fucking weird guy... Where he talks to, he talks to the... Because he's, he's, he's dead, he's, yeah. His he burns fell. magically he Sounds heal. gay as hell. Maybe. <laughs> no, I haven't. Have never seen that? <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's awful. A, it's Sounds a Soviet awful. film. It's Yeah, it's like come and see, but worse. If you can imagine that. <laughs> oh, I don't want to... Yeah. Wouldn't want to imagine that. <laughs> but... Who wants to start? <laughs> Brian's tired. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I'll start because I started before. Um, so final thoughts. I think it's a very good movie and it does deserve the recognition that it gets. Um, it was kind of one of the first films to try and, uh, you know, pay tribute to some of the uh, soldiers on the German side, you know, of World War II and such. And like I say, that final shot really drives that home. It's like, you know, you could see that being a statue or something, that image of those two guys half buried in the snow, you know, as a sort of memorial to um, to these guys that went through this battle. 
And um, I think it's pretty, pretty darn good. I, I like most stuff in it. Um, obviously, yeah, it has some things in it that you can criticize. But for what it is, I think it's really good. I would give it an 8 out of 10. What's the matter, Nate? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Ever, any, any score I give, you're just... I, 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 no, okay. no, no, it's good. So, it's, good. it's fine. Eight out of ten. It's fine. I'm, I'm glad it was an eight and not a seven. So, I'm happy. All right. I'm going to pass it uh, to Brian this time. Brian, go in the middle. I just want to know what gets a nine in your book because I haven't heard a nine no, from you in forever. We haven't gotten there yet, you know? Yeah. I shall surprise you one day. <laughs> Baby, just wait, okay? Uh, Waltz of Bashir 2. <laughs> Hell no. Hell no. <laughs> that movie's great. You know it. <laughs> the, the plot for that one's currently happening oh uh, yeah yeah uh, yeah <laughs> but Oops. uh also for sheer two the last boogaloo <laughs> gaza strip but um no it's just a very interesting movie you know and like we said earlier this is a very revered film um about a very revered battle and the film is now 30 years old which is crazy to think about um so it's nice to touch on it at this point in its uh history but um no, it's great. You know, it gets a lot of little things wrong if you really want to nitpick it, but overall it doesn't matter because it gets the feel of the battle and it really takes you on a journey of um, how horrible it was to be in that part of Russia in the fall of 42 into the winter of 43. So, you know, that being said, I easily give this film a 9.2 out of 10. It's just uh top five best German wartime experience films ever made. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's awesome definitely see it totally see it um and if, you know it's very easy to find today too which is nice so just uh watch it that being said i pass it on to mr birch yep it's um very good even with it's things that i bitched about whatever it's so good overall that those things don't matter as much to me uh, as far as the history and everything yeah but you get two hours to do that and you Again, this is basically seven months of this battle, and you can't do it in two hours. There's no fucking way. But the two hours that they chose to do was good to an extent, and then whatever. But, um, yeah, to give the experience of the, the morale, like the mental state just deteriorating very quickly. And that's, I, I think, in my opinion, this is a reason why the Germans lost more quickly than I think they did on other fronts is because the morale was just like, oh, we're fucked completely. We don't have our guys supporting us, nothing. And it shows that in this film. Like, we're fucked. And you have nothing to work with. You have no food and all that stuff. So really good on that point. Um, the sound effects sucked. But, again, it's 93. They don't have all these effects that you and I have access to now and whatever. But like, um, it didn't detract from the fact that it was like showing the human experience in a war and in the worst battle, again, in my opinion of mankind. So yeah, overall the way they portrayed it and everything, um, I'll go eight, six on this one. So yeah, eight, six, definitely like that's a high score. And it's decent. Highly recommend it. So, uh, just because we hadn't talked about it, I, I looked it up. They had a budget of uh, twenty million DEM, which I think is Deutsch Deutschmarks. Yeah, Deutschmarks. This is about ninety um, cents. It made. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. Okay, it, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, it, it made back ten million dollars. But it's about. It was about ninety to ninety-five cents, depending on the day back then. Okay. So equivalent so so that means that so that means they lost money then because if it's 20 million dem and they only made 10 million back then right Am I doing oh so right? so their gross worldwide was 10 their, million what they spent was 20 million and yeah. what they got back was 10 Do so they uh, lost money Deutschmarks. okay they lost money yeah like 20 20 dem and then they gained 10 million dollars back know, I, I could see that though because it's not i don't know it's not going to be going to see with the family. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it's, it's when did not. it come out? Is this a Christmas movie or is this more of a of a summer movie? You know, like. Also, it's like you know how how do you get people to 
watch something this intense. Because it, if that's the one adjective I could use to describe this film, is it's intense. And the fact that they made money back at all in those amounts is good. But, like, yeah, it's a very intense film. It's not, like, a happy-go-lucky whatever. It just... Everybody fucking loses in this film. And people don't want to see that shit, unfortunately. They're seeing it in reality now. But, like... It's yeah, like Airbud it or Stalingrad. <laughs> Where yeah. are you going with well, this, well, this this was released in, ni- in May, May 24th, 1995 in New York. Okay. Um, and, you know, we also have to think about this is also the German perspective. Yeah. I don't right. know. I mean, you know, we as history nerds want to see that. We love seeing stuff in its original language and everything like that. And mm-hmm. But to the common consumer, I don't think people would want to watch even in 95, a German army war film only in German. Yeah, it's really hard for a war film like something like this to catch on, you know, like be a hit, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. It's not a lot of platoons or SPRs, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So this I- is 95. This is 95. So before the great SPR onslaught. So, yeah, and like you know. they, they probably expected people probably expected to see like an old school war movie, like from the sixties mm-hmm. or fifties or whatever, and they Kelly's they got Heroes, this all that kind right, of stuff. like a, kind yeah. of a humorous whatever, but like they got this and they probably were like, well, the ah, name don't go lets see that. You know that you know. Well, it's not going to be a bed of roses. I'm sure a Giant lot of American audiences didn't even know what the fuck that was back then. I was yeah. just going to fucking say that, and yeah. you're right because Stalin yeah. guard. Yeah, stout. What? What? And that's probably the name too. Like, probably threw people off is because oh, I don't know why. Oh, it's a winter war movie. Ah, oh, no, I don't, don't want to see that. Like, there's a lot of factors into why it probably didn't make money immediately back. Yeah, and that that was that was something I forgot to, to pull up earlier. I just wanted to lay that out before I talk yeah. into it. I mean, yeah. like, everything's it's hard going last. Everything's been kind of business said. I, I've been. You know, it, this this movie is hard to kind of dive in because I think so much of it is so good. Yeah, there's nitpicky things that we've talked mm-hmm. about. You know, yeah, there's, um, you know, early 1990s film style that I could probably tear apart and rip apart. But I, I don't care about that. I care about its interpretation as a whole. And I, I think it does a phenomenal job in in just really talking about a part of history that I don't think gets much attention prior to to fucking snipers fucking each other so um i i think it is very interesting i love the dynamic of just the characters and the things and little moments that we've talked about and you know again this is a movie i can watch i've watched 40 something times and i can still have on um yeah there are little things that have kind of suffered throughout the ages but i i i don't i don't hate it so i think uh, just to keep it short tonight i think i'm going to give it like a 9.2 out of 10 screw mill gibsons i i want to give it a 9 i 9.5 i even wanted to give it a 10 but the more i just looked at little things that have kind of grown on me to be kind of be like oh okay you could yeah, you could have done it better whatever. even at that time That's right what I got yeah this time just a little bit yep. just just, yep. just just a little bit but yep. again it's not to be so nitpicky yep. a 9.2 out of 10 screw mill gibsons is very good these days yes. it seems like because we've had quite a run of shitty ass movies oh god <laughs> this last couple months so yep. <laughs> i don't think i don't think any of us have seen an eight or a nine in a little it's bit breath of so. fresh air <laughs> yeah yeah well this is uh could be worse david bowie could be kissing someone right now so you know it's just putting all the scores into the uh, computer that will tell us if hoth will be able to break through to palace uh at the department store we get a score of 8.75 out of 10. So the answer is no. Do not pass go, pass the Volga, and spend 10 years in prison. If you're lucky. What was the score? Uh, 8.75 out of 10. So It needs to be higher. Uh, I oh, doubt that. No, we're, because again... We're getting softer it's Michael's fault if you on shitty somebody. movies, but we're also getting... Yeah, I do actually blame Michael. Thank you very much. He's the only one who gave it a fucking... How... I gave it an eight six, and he gave it an eight. Yeah, but g- Michael gave it a square. Dude, it's a like, square. If you give it a movie. fucking yeah. nine or a ten, it, it can't be beat, and it it can be yeah. beat. What's reveling here? Don't. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
weren't we trying <laughs> weren't we trying to get Matt from Floodbusters on and he uh, we said we could do I think Mike was talking to him he's like you could do any movie you want and he mentioned Reveille and Mike was like no <laughs> yeah I was like yeah we can't do that we can't review our own work so thanks for your time guys happy new year and uh we'll catch you over the next coming weeks got some really cool shit planned so the best thing about the cold is you don't have to worry about the sunburn Dun, dun, dun. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to leave a rating. Otherwise, Mel Gibson won't stop screaming. If you like this content, make sure to check out our Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram pages. If you want to directly support our work, make sure to check out our Patreon. All these links are in the description below. Until the next time, Scuttlebutt out.